Hello, everyone, and welcome to this online conference on Israel and the New World Disorder, brought to you by the UCLA Eunice and Sarai Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and Haaretz newspaper. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. The Nazarian Center is dedicated to educating the general public in Los Angeles, in the United States, and around the world about modern Israel, its history, society, politics, and culture. For this reason, we've partnered with Israel's prestigious Haaretz newspaper for the second time now to bring you this online conference. Our first joint conference in November 2021 focused on Israel's national security challenges. Today's conference focuses on Israel's foreign policy and foreign relations. Admittedly, this is not a topic that is on most people's mind nowadays when it comes to Israel. The country is currently engulfed in domestic turmoil with massive protests over the Israeli government's controversial plans to weaken the power and independence of the Supreme Court. Beyond the Green Line in the West Bank, there is also turmoil with increasing Israeli and Palestinian violence. Against the backdrop of this growing turmoil and tensions in Israel and the West Bank, it might seem like a distraction to discuss Israel's foreign policy and foreign relations at a time like this. But Israel cannot put the rest of the world on hold. It still has to contend with a host of regional and global issues. The devastating war in Iraq, now entering its second year, continues to drag on and looks like it will escalate in the coming months as both sides launch new offensives. Israel is still under pressure to provide more support to Ukraine and to align its policy more closely with its Western allies. The United States, Israel's closest ally and longtime benefactor, is entering into what's been called a new Cold War with Russia and China, countries that Israel generally maintains good relations with. How can Israel maintain these important bilateral relationships? Will it be forced to take sides? In the Middle East, Iran's nuclear program continues to relentlessly advance, now putting Iran within reach of amassing enough highly enriched uranium for building nuclear weapons, a terrifying prospect that looks more likely to materialize with each passing day, especially now because a renewed nuclear agreement with Iran looks all but dead. Some now fear, or perhaps hope, that Israel will finally take military action against Iran's nuclear program, which could result in a war unlike Israel has any pre previously fought. Meanwhile, Iran continues to arm Hezbollah, which continues to threaten Israel and entrench itself on Israel's northern border. Of course, Israel is not the only state in the region that is worried about Iran's nuclear program and its regional influence. Israel's new alliances with Gulf Arab states are primarily driven by this shared concern, but these burgeoning alliances are still young and fragile, and they could quickly unravel if Palestinian violence escalates into a third intifada or if the Palestinian Authority collapses, scenarios which are certainly not far-fetched. Israel, therefore, cannot afford to ignore or postpone dealing with the war in Ukraine, the Iranian nuclear program, or the growing tensions and rivalry between the United States and Russia and China. Contrary to Henry Kissinger's famous quip that Israel has no foreign policy, only domestic policy, Israel must have a foreign policy. And as such, it should be debated and discussed, especially at a time when the global and regional strategic landscape is rapidly changing. To be sure, Israeli foreign policy cannot be neatly separated from its domestic politics, and its foreign relations will undoubtedly be impacted by its domestic politics, especially if Israel becomes a full-fledged illiberal democracy, as many now fear it will. Hence, it's necessary to consider how Israel's foreign relations, particularly with its Western allies, might be impacted by the new Israeli government and by what's currently happening in Israel. And it's also well worth considering whether the illiberal and populist orientation of parts of Israel's governing coalition is itself a reflection of broader global trends. All of these important questions and issues will be tackled during this high-level conference, which will feature one-on-one -on -one interviews with diplomats and former policymakers and panel discussions with leading experts. I'm grateful to all of the participants in this conference for generously giving their time and sharing their expertise and insights with us. I'm also grateful to the staff at the Nazarian Center and my colleagues at Haaretz for all their hard work on this conference. And I'm very grateful to the Diane and Guilford Glazer Foundation for underwriting today's conference. Thank you all.
Finally, I want to thank our audience members for joining us from wherever in the world you are, and I encourage you all to send us your questions throughout the conference. Myself and Amir Tabon, the deputy editor of Haaretz's English edition, will try to answer as many of these questions as we can in the Q&A session at the end of the conference. We hope you enjoy watching this conference and find it to be informative, engaging, and thought-provoking. And now I will turn over to Haaretz's editor-in-chief, Aluf Ben. Hello, I'm Aluf Ben, and I'm happy to open the second joint conference of Haaretz with the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. Dedicated this time to Israel and the New World Disorder. A lot has changed in Israel and in the world at large since our last conference over a year ago. Israel is ruled by a new coalition headed by a resurrected Bibi Netanyahu, coming back from a year and a half in opposition. And this new coalition, with the first time a Kahanist party around its cabinet table, is committed to demolish the fragile, delicate structure of Israeli democracy and rebuild a new, in Israel in a new version of a more autocratic, more nationalist, and more religious state, committed to annexation of West Bank territory, committed to turn the Supreme Court and the judicial system into a branch of the executive, and committed to make Israel less equal between Jews and non-Jews. This government is facing a different relationship with the United States and with the rest of the international community. Netanyahu has yet to receive an invitation to visit Washington and meet President Joe Biden. He has yet to receive an invitation to meet his friends uh, from the Abraham Accords in the United Arab Emirates, which he hoped to visit right after coming back to power. And Netanyahu is telling people that he's about to make peace with Saudi Arabia. Could that be sustainable when his coalition partners are happy at pictures of, of damage and destruction and pogroms of Jewish settlers against their Palestinian neighbors after a deadly attack in which two settler teenagers were killed? This is happening when Iran, Israel's arch enemy in the region, is inching closer towards a nuclear weapon, when Iran has become Russia's main partner in the war in Ukraine, supplying Russia with arms in return for more diplomatic cover for its nuclear program and probably more sophisticated Russian weapon system to defend its nuclear sites against possible attack. This is happening in Israel when the Palestinian front is on the verge of explosion, if not past it already, both in the West Bank and vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. Can the Netanyahu government, with its shaky support within Israel, facing an unprecedented wave of protest against its judicial upheaval, facing an unprecedented uh, economic downturn caused entirely by the actions and plans of the new government, rather than by domestic uh, economic, economic uh, variables. Uh, this, is, this is a new situation when we hear uh, reservists threatening not to, not to report to their units because of their protest, the actions of the new government against democracy. Can Israel deal with these, these challenges to its national security from Iran, from Lebanon, in the West Bank, from Gaza, facing this domestic uh, rift between supporters of the government and its regime upheaval, and the protesters who oppose, who want to keep Israeli democracy the way, the way it was. And all this is happening when the international community is mostly focused on the war in Ukraine, the largest ground war in Europe since 1945, fought over the same battlefields of the First and Second World Wars. And uh, Israel so far uh, has sat on the fence, declaring support for Ukraine, but being very careful not to break ties with Putin, with Russia, and facing uh, growing pressure from the United States, from Western governments, 
to be more supportive of Ukraine, facing Ukrainian pleas to receive Israeli weapon systems, especially uh, missile and drone defense systems, and so far standing up against it. Can Israel sustain that pressure and remain on the sidelines when Russia has become uh, Iran's chief ally? Can Israel sustain uh, this policy when the U.S. and Western governments are less and less supportive of its own government because of its far-right components, because of its uh, policy towards the Palestinians, because of its policy to destroy Israeli democracy and build an authoritarian state? All this and more will be discussed in the conference. And I'd like to thank all the participants and our partners from UCLA, and especially my friend, Professor Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. Now I'd like to move to an interview with Tsipi Livni, Israel's former foreign minister and deputy prime minister and chief negotiator uh, with the Palestinians and a prominent figure in Israeli public life. Please. Hello, I'm Amir Tibon, and joining me now is Tsipi Livni, the former Foreign Minister and Justice Minister of Israel. Hello, Tsipi. Thank you so much for joining the Haaretz UCLA conference. Thank you for uh, inviting uh, me. We also had you with us at our previous conference in 2021, and it's a pleasure to have you again. And I want to start by asking you about the biggest story in the headlines in Israel right now, the judicial overhaul being pushed by the government and the sense of a threat to Israeli democracy. Where do you stand on the biggest issue in the news right now? Exactly as uh, you described before, it's a battle for uh, the future of Israel. It's about the soul of Israel. Uh, it's about the nature of Israel as a democracy. Israel was established as a Jewish democratic state, mainly uh, the nation state for the Jewish people with equal rights to all its citizens. Uh, these are not judicial reforms. It's not about, only about uh, the status uh, of the Supreme Court or the relations between the different authorities in Israel. Uh, it's about whether we would have just one authority uh, that is ruling without any checks and balances. And this is unacceptable. And when you look at this issue from a more global perspective, do you share the assessment that this is pushing Israel further away from the family of democratic nations um, and strengthening our affiliation with other countries that are less committed to liberal democracy? Uh, I, I, I believe in a concept uh, saying uh, globally nation, that uh, Israel is a nation state, but part of uh, the free world. And this is also part of our values. When an Israeli leader is coming to the US, usually we are opening our remarks by saying that we share the same values. Uh, so this is the base uh, and we need to keep it. By the way, we need to keep it because this is what Israel is, because I'm an Israeli citizen, I'm fighting uh, these reforms or these uh, uh, changes in Israel uh, because of the nature of Israel. It is less about the ties and connection between Israel and other countries. It's about what Israel is. We see so many Israelis protesting in the last few weeks, hundreds of thousands taking to the streets. You yourself spoke at one of the large demonstrations recently. Um, where do you think this is going to end? What's the end game for this protest movement? The good news is that there's a fight. We had uh, five rounds of elections with no substance. It uh, was just against Netanyahu, and rightly so. But now you see people going, taking the streets, fighting for democracy. So there is a better understanding in Israel that we cannot turn a blind eye to some extreme ideology because they are taking over, they are ruling, and they want to change the nature of Israel. So, frankly, after the election, I, wo I, I was pessimistic because I understood what's going on. Uh, it was clear to me that this is where they are, they are heading and what to take us. But now more and more Israelis understand it. So uh, it creates a new uh, camp in Israel that is fighting for the nature of Israel. So it's too early to know what will be the outcome, but it's already clear that 
this is going to be a, a part of a bigger understanding, wider understanding that Israel needs to keep its values as a democracy. And that's good news. Now, you've worked before with Benjamin Netanyahu. You served as a minister and a director general in two of his governments. You, got, you were also political rivals for many years. Um, and I think you have a good understanding uh, of how he views uh, global affairs and political issues. What do you think was the impact uh, on him when we heard President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken and French President Macron all speak out against this judicial overhaul and warn that it will hurt the shared values at the foundation of Israel's ties with their countries? Yeah, I'm sure that it is very important. Knowing Netanyahu, I'm sure that it was very uh, influential uh, and effective because uh, his dream was the day after the election to be invited to, to uh, uh, work with the United States, and rightly so. Uh, the average Israeli understand the importance of the relations between Israel and the United States. It's strategic. It uh, uh, connected to Israel's security, and not only. And therefore, when the, this kind of message is coming, I think that it opened also eyes of many Israelis. But I'm sure that for Netanyahu, I think that this was a moment in which he understood that he need to take it in consideration. Unfortunately, it doesn't take us in consideration, but he needs to take this in consideration. Uh, but, you know, one question a lot of people are asking right now is, does he actually have control? Uh, does Netanyahu still control this government? We saw just recently the summit in Aqaba with the U.S. and the Palestinians and Jordan and Egypt. There was a joint statement put out that was supposed to also <laughs> represent the Israeli position. And then we heard ministers in his own government saying, we're not going to respect it. It's as if they just don't care what he's committing to. So, is he still the one in the driver's seat? Frankly, I'm sick and tired of hearing that maybe he's not responsible, they are more extreme, he would like to, to do something else, but he can't, he's too weak, it's his responsibility, he's the Prime Minister. He formed this government uh, when uh, negotiating the uh, political agreements before the formation of the government, he gave them a blank paper saying you can write and ask no matter what, without even negotiating this, uh, and therefore he's responsible, he's the head, he's uh, the leader, he's the head of this government, he's the prime minister. It is clear that there are more extreme fractions within this government, but you know what? When I'm facing this kind of extreme ideology, I, I'm saying, okay, this is ideology. Netanyahu understands he is not an ideological, uh, uh, he doesn't have these ideological uh, views about, uh, about the West Bank, about the annexation. He knows better what gives Israel security. And it's not a new settlement or, or legalizing illegal outposts. This is why he's more responsible. Because the others, maybe they believe that if they will build another settlement, this brings security. It's not. But he knows better. I was there with him. We sat together in the security government, and therefore he's even responsible more than others, because he understands what needs to be done, what shouldn't be done, and he let them do it. Well, that's interesting, because that's also the approach of the American administration. They've been saying for day one, we're not speaking to Smotrich or Bengvir. For us, the address in Jerusalem is Netanyahu. Uh, but, you know, there's also another approach that we're hearing more and more from the Israeli right wing these days. People saying, why do we need America? Why should we care so much about where Biden stands about this, what the Democratic Party is uh, saying? And we're seeing an attraction uh, of men in the Israeli right to other world figures, Putin, Orban. What do you think about this trend in the Israeli political discourse? Uh, it's a matter of understanding priorities. Uh, and uh, priorities for, for the country, for the state of Israel. Those understanding the nature of the relationship and its importance for security would say, okay, we need to keep very good relations with the United States. But for some ideological group, if they need to choose between greater Israel, building more settlements and annexation, even in the expense 
of the relations with the United States, they will do it because this is their priority. They are using security, but it's not their priority. Their priority is the land of Israel. It's greater Israel. It's about the land and not about the existence of Israel as a Jewish democratic state, as our, as our priority and vision. In your view, as someone who started her political career in the Likud party and later was the leader of the centrist Kadima party, what is the main split today in Israeli politics? Is it still the old right wing versus left wing that we were used to for many years? Or are we looking at another kind of major split redefining the political camps in our country and society? The split is between those believing that Israel should be a Jewish state from a religious perspective. Uh, with less democracy, they see democracy as more a system of election and less about a uh, set of values. And between those believing that we need to keep the hyphen uh, between these two uh, base of Israel as a Jewish and a democracy. And this is the real split. Those that uh, are, are trying to turn the national aspect of the Jewish state into a religious one. And uh, those that uh, would like to keep uh, Israel as a Jewish and a democracy. And uh, I'm, I must say that I'm very happy that uh, people understood and they understand what's going on. I saw the signs, as you know, uh, for a few years now, and I spoke up against it, but I felt that I'm the only one. And now it's so good to see hundreds of thousands of people taking the streets. It's wonderful. I, um, I think many Israelis share your sense of hope. Uh, but what I want to ask you is, where will this protest movement go if, at the end of it, the government will pass this judicial overhaul? Where will all this energy be diverted in such a situation? Uh, I, I know that there are those that are saying, you know, you can hear it uh, within the demonstrations, but we need a leader. Some of them are asking also me to come back to politics. But what I'm saying is, that's wonderful. When, when there, even when there is no political leadership, uh, when people uh, understand what's going on and decide to leave everything, to leave their uh, comfort zone and to go and do something about it, it's wonderful. I don't know how this will be translated into politics in future elections, but things that were underneath the surface uh, become very clear. So it was very difficult to convince my friends that this is where they are heading. But now it's so clear, it was so brutally uh, forced, uh, the legislation and everything. So I think that uh, that it's clear now, and I, I hope that it will not turn into, uh, I don't know, to dust in the future. I hope so. And um, if we saw a scenario where the government did eventually agree to soften or moderate this legislation, change some of the more frightening components that it includes, what do you think will happen then? The legislation is, uh, these are the symptoms of, of their major plan. So even if we will make some changes within the legislation and maybe, I don't know, the committee that uh, is choosing the judges will, will turn into something more acceptable, it will not end uh, the trend and their vision. This is why uh, it just, you know, it, it, it will not heal. Uh, the situation. The gap between the two different parts of Israel now, the two different camps, is very wide and very deep. So it's more than just correcting uh, specific uh, legislation now. So on that note, the last question I want to ask you is, what is the role in these challenging times for people outside of Israel, uh, people who support the state of Israel, people in the Jewish diaspora, perhaps, who love this country, but at the same time are concerned and worried about the direction that it's going right now. What role do they have in these very challenging times for Israel? So I'm saying the opposite. Look at Israel. People who believe, like you, that Israel is a democracy, 
are fighting within Israel to keep Israel as a democracy and are not giving up. So supporting Israel doesn't mean that you need to support the specific government policy. You can object it, as we do. It doesn't mean that you are against Israel. It means that you are for a, de a democratic Israel. And this is what I'm saying to my friends for many years now. When you support Israel, you support the existence of Israel as a Jewish democratic state, and you support the right of Israel to defend itself. But you can criticize any Israeli government policy. It doesn't make you anti-Semitic or anti-Israeli. This is what we are doing in the streets. Tsipi Livni, former Foreign Minister and Justice Minister of Israel, thank you very much again for joining us at this year's conference. Uh, it was a fascinating conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Hello from Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to speak to the Haaretz annual conference, and it's a real pleasure. And let me start by talking a little bit about the Israel-U.S. Uh, relations. Uh, generally speaking, the relations between our two countries are strong, are solid, are very friendly, and they are based not only on relations between the two governments, but also a close affinity between the two peoples. From where I sit, I see um, the depth and the breadth of our relations, and what we see together is really heartwarming. I, I don't think that until you sit here, you see the full picture. It's quite amazing. We do not have a closer ally than the United States. And I don't believe that the U.S. has uh, many close allies as Israel. It's not only a one-way street, it's a two-way street because we help each other and we do a lot together. I would say that in this administration, the most friendly uh, element or one of the most friendly is President Biden himself. He has a, a lifelong record of support for Israel, of love for Israel, of friendship. I followed President Biden in his uh, visit in Israel in July 22. It was a remarkable visit. And my impression is that his relations to Israel is not only a rational one, but also an emotional one. This, of course, project <clears throat> on the administration uh, at large. It doesn't mean that Israel and the United States agree on everything. Obviously, there are some disagreements and divergences with our challenges to our relations, but all, all in all, I think uh, we have managed to <clears throat> make the best of our converging interests and to manage our differences to the extent that uh, they uh, exist. Obviously, the United States follows very closely what's happening in Israel, or the relevant developments, and relates to them. And there are also long-term uh, long challenges to uh, Israel here in the U.S., which for a shortage of time I will not relate to, but uh, important to manage that, uh, to mention that uh, we need to address um, uh, to, to prevent erosion in bipartisan support for Israel and for the Israel-US relations. We have to address the ongoing campaign to delegitimize the state of Israel. There are challenges to the relations between Israel and the Jewish community and some distancing there and some other long-term challenges that we have to face. But let me focus uh, here mostly on the geopolitical issues and let me say a few words about uh, Iran. Iran, as you all know, is a number one and two and three priority in uh, Israel's national security agenda. I would say that today Israel and the United States are close on Iran, much closer than was the case a few years back, or as close as I can remember a few years back. We both agree that uh, Iran should not be allowed to become a nuclear armed state. We both agree that Iran is the most destabilizing factor in the Middle East and today also in Europe, in the heart of Europe. And we both agree that uh, we have to work uh, together with additional partners in order to push back against the Iranian ambitions in both the nuclear uh, and the regional fields. Uh, as we know, the US strategy on Iran for many years focused on reaching a nuclear deal with uh, Iran. Uh, however, today that deal is 
uh, off the table, at least for now. It's not dead, but it's off the table. And this is because of the Iranian maximalist positions in uh, negotiations on the nuclear deal, what Iran has been constantly doing in its own uh, nuclear program, and but more importantly, and more recently, the developing relations between Iran and Russia that come to play in Ukraine, and the internal situation in Iran, where we see people rise, rising and demanding liberties and the regime repressing uh, its own populace. So as a result, as I said, the deal is off the table, and we, Israel and the United States, are now into a close dialogue about a holistic strategy to face Iran, even if there is no nuclear deal in the foreseeable future, which is based first and more foremost on enhancing deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran, U.S. deterrence and Israeli deterrence, and that factors in the, uh, what's happening in the nuclear field, Iranian destabilizing regional activities, the cooperation between Russia and Iran, the internal situation in Iran, and many other uh, factors. Let me uh, say uh, one more word about the internal situation in Iran. I think uh, it was for a long time kind of relegated to a secondary role in our strategic thinking about Iran. But uh, I think that today what we see in Iran is a defining moment, a kind of a Soviet moment where we see the shaking of the foundations of uh, the Iranian Islamic Republic. Uh, in a way, one can say that Iran, uh, the regime lost the people, and that gap is unbridgeable, and that gap will deepen, and we have to factor it into our strategic thinking about Iran, and we just cannot ignore it. Beginning with sounding support for the Iranian people, uh, and followed by, by other uh, practical uh, measures. Obviously for us in Israel, the number one issue is the Iranian nuclear program. We are following it very closely. Uh, it has gotten to some dangerous levels in terms of breakout time uh, to military-grade fissile material and some other elements in their program. And uh, Israel has stated repeatedly, and on this, as you know, there's no opposition and coalition in Israel, that Israel is determined to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear armed state. <clears throat> We're also working very closely with the US administration about uh, deepening and expanding Israeli Arab peace and Israeli Arab normalization in the region. We believe that the Abraham Accords uh, have been a game changer in the region and the key to the future of that region in, ter in terms of uh, the well-being of the, uh, the, the residents of the region, in terms of uh, pushing back against uh, Iran. If you look back at what happened over the last two years, it's quite remarkable. Uh, in, in no time we achieved uh, remarkable relations, economic trade in many, many other areas. We have uh, seen numerous bilateral uh, agreements with our new peace partners. We have multilateral frameworks. We have several working groups, trilateral working groups with the US and, and uh, the UAE. We have a quadrilateral framework with uh, including India, six working groups under the framework of the Negev Forum. The U.S. is part and parcel of all of, the, all of this. The U.S. is critical to all of this. And we also have uh, cooperation under the umbrella of CENTCOM. As I said, this is critical uh, for the well-being of the region, but also has an important significance in the context of uh, pushing back uh, against Iran and its uh, proxies. And we are working very closely with the administration in order to deepen and expand. We, of course, would like to advance our relations with Saudi Arabia and so other actors. This will be continue to be very high on our agenda. Uh, another area where we have a very close dialogue, uh, but rather challenge, is the Israeli-Palestinian area, as we all know. This is a very hot topic uh, in, Israel, in Israel, and uh, it is uh, what we see today 
is a neg negative dynamic that is fed. I don't want to discuss the uh, political issues, but I will discuss one element which is very high on our agenda, and that is the escalating security situation as we all, uh, we have seen the wave of terror attacks and the uh, Israeli countermeasures. Uh, the key to that is the weakening of the Palestinian Authority, uh, the loss of uh, security control over parts of uh, the West Bank, the proliferation of uh, armed terror groups that necessitates uh, uh, the IDF to go in and take uh, action against these groups for uh, lack of actions by uh, the PA. And, what is, and this is also followed by a very heated atmosphere uh, celebrating the blood of Israelis, incitement, and so on. Uh, for us, uh, and we are working very closely with the administration in order to arrest this negative dynamic and reverse it. We understand that this necessitates security measures, economic measures, and political measures, and we are trying to de-escalate the situation and arrest the situation. Obviously, there are a lot of complexities. We are all aware of them but this is very high uh, on our agenda. And we're also mindful of the need to try and get the Palestinians on board of the uh, trend of Israeli Arab normalization because they too can benefit uh, from that. <clears throat> Let me say a few words about the situation in Ukraine, uh, which we all follow very closely. As I speak to you, we are marking the first anniversary of the Russian invasion to Ukraine. And I want to say on this that uh, some presented uh, the Israeli position as, as if Israel is equivocal and uh, sitting on the fence. I think this is not the case. I think Israel has been quite clear all along that politically and morally we support Ukraine. Israel joined all UN resolutions on this issue. We provided a lot of humanitarian support for the Ukrainians. We uh, took in uh, numerous refugees from Ukraine, also from Russia. Uh, and the one area where Israel uh, drew a line is not to provide lethal weapon systems to Ukraine uh, due to uh, several national security considerations, sig significant considerations that have to do with the fact that we want to maintain our freedom of action against Iran militarily in the region and we don't want to conflict with Russia on that. We want to prevent the fall of sensitive Israeli technologies into the wrong hand. We don't have enough for ourselves, and there are some other elements uh, of significance in our national secur security thinking. But up to that line, Israel has done and is doing everything possible to support U Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. We will push that line to the extent possible and will do more and more. As you all heard recently, Israel promised to provide Ukraine with a life-saving early warning system to uh, alert uh, citizens to go, civilians to go to shelters in the face of incoming rockets and missiles, and we will do uh, more. Uh, to sum up, I would say that as we, this year uh, marks Israel's 75th year of uh, independence, we uh, of course are a, uh, we are an imperfect democracy, we are a challenged democracy, uh, we shouldn't take, uh, but we, we achieved uh, major successes in our 75 years of independence. We should not take that for granted, and we should always remember that throughout our 75 years of independence, the U.S. stood at our side, the U.S. is our closest ally, and we must continue to foster our relations with the United States of America. Thank you. The Nazarian Center is dedicated to promoting the study of modern Israel, both at UCLA, in the local community, and now around the world. In terms of teaching, our primary mission is to teach UCLA undergraduate students about Israel. Within the local community, we put on programs, lectures, and talks. What we do fundamentally is Israel education, not Israel advocacy. We're not there to try to convince people to believe a certain thing or to think a certain way. We're just trying to arm people with more information, more knowledge, and a deep deeper and more nuanced understanding.
Welcome to our panel on Israel's new right-wing government and whether it's part of a global trend towards illiberal democracy. I want to introduce our panelists. Susan Glass is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes the weekly letter from Biden's Washington and appears on the Political Scene podcast. Susan is co-author of last year's The Divider, Trump in the White House. Daniel Gordis, Corrett Distinguished Fellow at Shalem College and author of a biography of Menachem Begin. His latest book, Impossible Takes Longer, 75 years after its creation, has Israel fulfilled its founders' dreams, is coming out shortly. Eva Elouz holds the Rose Isaac Chair in Sociology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is a Senior Research Fellow at the Van Leer Institute and at the Institute for Israeli Thought. Daniel, if we can start with you, before we dive into its foreign policy repercussions, let's get a handle on how to characterize Israel's current government and Netanyahu's sixth time round as prime minister. Israel's had plenty of right-wing governance since Menachem Begin's revolution in 1977, when he broke the chain of left-leaning coalitions, but this time is different. Is right wing still an adequate term to describe this government? I think not. Uh, when Israel has had right wing governments in the past, they have typically been matters of foreign policy and security. There have also been sometimes internal issues about economics and so forth. But by and large, back from the days of Menachem Begin um, all the way till today, even under Bibi Netanyahu, right wing has typically had some implication about Iran, Oslo. Uh, the Palestinian issue or whatever. This government is distinguishing itself, and I use that word quite ironically, um, by not having any particularly interesting things to say about the Palestinians or Iran, about which there's basically zero daylight between Meretz and Netanyahu. Um, it's distinguished itself by uh, having criminals in the form of Aryeh Deri, an open fascist in the form of Batsala Smatrich, an open anti-LGBTQ person in the person of Avi Maoz, person who's dodged the draft and is inciting, even as we speak today, uh, in the person of Itamar ben Gvir. Um, this is a very different kind of right wing. This is not ideological right wing. This is not public policy right wing. This is not policy right wing. This is um, tragically, and I say this with tremendous sadness, it looks a lot like a gang of thugs. And um, the issues of judicial reform are, are less concrete. In other words, there I think there are arguments to be made for some form of judicial reform. Even people who I know very much in the center, even somewhat left of center, in the judicial world would argue that the current system does need some fixing. Uh, but not only the substance of the proposed reforms, but especially the way in which they're basically being rammed through, even in the face of polls that show that more than half of, a, of Israeli society, including, by the way, a significant portion of Likud voters, are opposed to proceeding at this pace in this direction. It shows that this is all about personal party politics uh, and so forth. As we're speaking, the government is actually trying to even get its claws into the Directorion, I guess the Board of Directors of the National Library of Israel, uh, which is a critically important mistake because the National Library of Israel has been obviously far above politics for its entire existence. The construction of the new building right across the street from the Knesset is an opportunity for a huge celebration of everything that Israel stands for in terms of intellectual openness, creativity, uh, openness to the Arab and Muslim worlds and so forth. And this is being done over an issue with Shai Nitzan and a, and a personal vendetta that Bibi's government has with a particular person because of his former role in a former job and writing a letter of indictment it's just become very, very ugly and very, very sad. And I'll just add was one final con concluding opening remark, that we find ourselves really now on the eve of what should be an extraordinary celebratory moment. I mean, 75 years of statehood, and um, obviously more than that of Zionism since 1896, 1897, uh, should be an extraordinary opportunity for us to take stock of the really significant and real accomplishments of the state of Israel. And there are many things that are heartbreaking about what we're watching and witnessing now. Uh, but among them is that it seems very likely that this 75th Yom Ha'atzmaut is going to come and pass with tremendous sadness, with tremendous knots in the stomach. Um, and for those of us who don't think we're necessarily going to live to see the 100th, and I say that, you know, honestly, uh, it's another 25 years from now, uh, it's a, I feel personally almost robbed 
by the opportunity to celebrate what this country has accomplished, which is extraordinary, but it is going through a very ugly and painful phase right now. Thank you. Eva, you've written about how Israel's extreme right has slowly and methodically been building towards this day when it would be seated basically at the apex of power in Israel. You've written that it's been aided by demographic trends and also by a left wing that was too polite to challenge its theocratic character and its championing of the settlers. So is the rise of the far right in Israel a unique local phenomenon, bearing in mind the unique history of the country and its populations? And how far does it fit into a broader global trend towards illiberalism? So let me say, first of all, that to my surprise, I find myself agreeing with everything you said, uh, Daniel. Um, to go back to your question, um, well, certainly populism and uh, illiberal democracy is a wo worldwide phenomenon. And we can say, first of all, that populist leaders actually imitate each other. Uh, they have affinities with each other. And we can also say that there is an ideology that is carefully disseminated worldwide. This is why we can say that at least superficially, there are similarities between Israeli extreme right and the extreme right of other countries. Uh, superficially doesn't mean it is irrelevant or not important. And I want to talk about briefly the similarities and the differences. So, you know, there are many characteristics to populism, but I just want to focus on two. The first one is that populist leaders no longer have any reticence or reservation toward major, major, majoritarianism, which is the tyranny of the majority against the minorities. They want to redefine entirely the relationship between majority and minorities and no longer want to protect minorities from persecution or discrimination and even claim in many cases that democracies have gone too far protecting minorities and even claiming that majorities are actually controlled by minorities. So really it's about, I think uh, uh, populism is about an assertion of power uh, by majorities. They want to reclaim some privileges which they feel robbed of. And um, this goes also with a strong affirmation of the group's identity. Uh, populism is more, I think, than identitarian. It is hyper-identitarian. It wants to reaffirm the greatness of the majority group and the boundaries of the majority group. So it's the Christian Europe of Orban and Kaczynski, and it is the Hinduism of the BJP in uh, India, and it is the glorious past of France of Zemmour, and it is the nostalgia from uh, the time where England uh, could get things done and was a world power of UKIP. Uh, and, you know, it's the European heritage of the Party of Freedom in, in the Netherlands. And, of course, in Israel, it is first and foremost the reaffirmation of the Jewish superiority and sole ownership over uh, uh, Israel and probably beyond. Um, there is a major difference between the European countries I mentioned and in the U.S. and Israel. In these countries, minorities are the result of immigration and economic globalization. In Israel, this is very different. The Arab minority living in Israel are natives. From their standpoint, from their standpoint, they were dispossessed of their land. This means that the rule of the majority feeds into a military and nationalist conflict, which is likely to become violent if the kind of very um, uh, subtle relationship that was formed here uh, between Jews and Arabs is actually uh, disturbed. And uh, I, I don't need to tell you that Arabs constitute 21 percent of uh, among the 9 million of Israeli citizens, which, is, which means it's not a small minority. And in fact, if you uh, calculate the number of Palestinians living in Gaza and the West Bank, we, we, we have today one million Palestinians more than Jews in the entire area. Um, the second characteristic of populism in many countries worldwide 
is that it's an onslaught on liberal elites by other elites which hide themselves in a way behind uh, a people they falsely claim to represent. Um, the liberals are viewed as controlling the media, the universities, the legal establishment, despite, of course, the fact that they are powerful moguls controlling uh, uh, media and actually trying to disseminate a right-wing agenda. And despite also the fact that the legal establishment in many countries is frequently far from being left-wing and is actually quite right-wing, this is certainly the case in Israel. So, um, in many countries around the world, populist leaders have undermined the legitimacy of these competing elites by recruiting parts of the middle classes and the working classes. In France, for example, we have seen a massive shift of the working class who voted for the communists to the Rassemblement National of uh, Marine Le Pen. And in Israel, this is exactly what happened with uh, 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 Begin in 1997. Um, where um, the Mizrahi vote was actually quite crucial in determining uh, the shift to right-wing uh, power. Now, when you look at today's government, what is interesting, in my opinion, is that there has never been such a wide Mizrahi working class constituency in power. Likud, Shas, and to a great extent religious Zionism as, as well, are all nourished by Mizrahi vote. Mizrahi, who claim to have been severely discriminated by the left, by the Ashkenazi uh, left. So, here again, I want to stress some very important differences with the other countries. Contrary to France, where you have, I would say, probably 30% of the vote which still goes to the left, and the USA, where you have a democratic uh, party which is in power, in Israel, less than 7% of people uh, claim they identify with the left, which means practically that the left has com completely disappeared and lives probably only in the imagination of the people who have made it uh, an insult to be a leftist today in Israel is uh, to be a, tra a traitor. And I would add that this is all the more shocking, and that's another difference maybe with other countries, that the left is uh, the one, is the constituency which actually established the main institutions of its, this country and sacrificed the best of its sons and daughters to it. Uh, so I just want to say that the lie is all the more blatant. Thanks. We'll follow up some of those issues in a minute. Susan. Uh, you've written about how, at the end of the Trump term, even staunch loyalist Mike Pompeo was truly scared that the crazies were in charge of the White House and the Pentagon. Bearing in mind the far-right parties sitting in Israel's government and Netanyahu's all-holds-barred drive to upend the judicial system, which the Financial Times' Martin Wolf recently called the naked power grab, and the exploding violence in the West Bank. What does all this look like from DC? Does it seem sui generis, Israel just being crazy again, or are there flashes of recognition from the Trump presidency? Well, thank you so much. And I have to say, uh, these have already been terrific and insightful comments uh, with which I agree, because I think that's the struggle for people, not just in Washington, but everywhere to understand what context to place these events in. And uh, at, at this point, unfortunately, we're not looking at uh, this as the very beginning of a, a backlash, a democratic backlash in Israel. It does have an international context, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people being in the streets, standing up for democratic small d rights under assault is, is unfortunately, something that has been a familiar staple of the times. I do think in Washington, there's an additional complication, though, in trying to understand what context to view these, these events in Israel right now. And that is, of course, that Netanyahu is a very familiar character here in Washington. Uh, there's no capital, perhaps, in which he's more familiar uh, than Washington outside of Israel itself. And so I think that you know, the reality is sinking in, but perhaps is slow to sink in, that this is not 
the same kind of Netanyahu government. It's not the same kind of Netanyahu coalition that the previous governments have been. And so, you know, that's part of it uh, in terms of trying to understand what's really happening there. The other thing that I think is significant uh, for people to understand in Israel is that, you know, there's just an enormous amount on Washington's plate right now. And I've been struck by the fact that uh, these events in Israel might have gotten much more attention at a different time were it not for the war in Ukraine, uh, which has become uh, the consuming foreign policy issue, along with the very rapidly worsen worsening relations with China. Uh, and uh, then add in the earthquake in Turkey and other things. And this has just not been a focus, I would say, in Washington to the extent that it might have been at another moment. But to the extent that it has been, remember that the Republican Party is also not the same Republican Party that it was before. And I do think, you know, you look at these events in Israel and how Netanyahu has been willing to go places that even in his long career, he has not yet gone to before. And that is very resonant with anyone who watched uh, Trump and the Republican Party, right? Uh, you know, that in the, the sort of after the events here in the United States of, of the 2020 election and particularly Trump's willingness to take not only himself, but his entire party over a cliff of actually seeking to overturn the election results. Um, you know, you, you have to wonder how much that has inspired uh, uh, Netanyahu and others to be willing to do things that, that a decade ago before Trump, they might not have been willing to do, that certainly he is offering a template uh, for shamelessness uh, and for the mainstreaming of previously radical or unthinkable political ideas uh, in a democratic society. So I do think that these movements speak to each other. And one thing I would point out before the rest of our conversation is that here in the U.S., as we are gearing up for the 2024 Republican uh, presidential primaries, Donald Trump is running again to return to power. And he also is not uh, the same Donald Trump who ran in 2016 uh, or who was in the White House for the subsequent four years uh, as he has become somewhat more marginalized inside his party and while he's been out of power sort of uh, you know sulking in his uh, country club in Florida he has become a much more extreme and radicalized version uh, of his previous political persona and I'm not sure the extent to which people fully appreciate that his willingness to openly associate with white nationalists, uh, with QAnon adherents, um, uh, his smaller and smaller circle of more and more extreme uh, uh, and fringe advisors is something that would become immediately apparent, obviously, if he were to return to the White House. But I'm not sure the extent to which people understand that um, the constraints that did hamper him to a certain extent in his first few years uh, in the White House would would not be operative by and large uh, in a second Trump term. And so, uh, you know, again, that to me is very interesting in the comparison with Netanyahu and this this government there being a very different one than than the many, many years of Netanyahu we've seen in power before. And I don't think that Washington yet has a new uh, template and a new playbook for understanding this as a very different moment in Israeli politics. Indeed. Eva, uh, before this latest iteration of Netanyahu, as we've just been saying, you know, he's come through several kinds of incarnations, he was already building pretty close ties with nationalists, uh, populist and illiberal leaders around uh, the globe. Some might call him a stalwart founding member of the illiberal international. Uh, those friends range from Bolsonaro to Orban, Trump, Modi. Now he has a whole host of Gulf allies, too, who are also firmly in the illiberal mode. Uh, is this now where Israel's alliances are going? You know, whereas in the past Israel used to share the idea that, used to celebrate the idea that it had shared values that founded its relations with the US and Europe, do illiberal shared values have the same force, whether rhetorically or in the real world? And how stable 
are illiberal regimes and the common ground that they try and build between them? Many questions, <laughs> uh, important questions. Um, first of all, I think you're entirely right uh, that before this government, uh, there has been, I think, a radical shift in the kind of leaders uh, Netanyahu kept company with. And I think he felt more comfortable with anti-Semitic Trump and Orban than he did with uh, liberal members of the American uh, Jewish community, for example. And, uh, you know, more generally, I think he, it seems to me that Netanyahu felt more comfortable with Putin than he felt with uh, Obama, uh, which is saying a lot. And I think uh, this is because um, probably this notion of legitimacy that you were referring to is not something that they think that Netanyahu or others think much about. And that is in marked uh, contradistinction, for example, with the right that Daniel Gordis was referring to and with previous uh, left uh, governments. Um, I think Bibi and his colleagues don't think much about legitimacy, think they think of politics exclusively in terms of political might and force. And in a way, it's a proof for me that they don't really understand very well at least one part of the world. That is the fact that the world is increasingly preoccupied by issues, for example, like climate change and by the kind of norms you need to enforce internationally in order to make the planet livable. They are entirely oblivious to what is uh, happening uh, there. So, um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, moreover, I think you have to understand that for religious Jews, which form a big part of this coalition, only the uh, legitimacy of uh, religious Jewish law actually matters. Um, I think some of them are really convinced that God and history is on their side, and uh, everything that is happening for them is a proof that they have a special assistance and approval from above. Uh, so these issues of legitimacy don't touch them, I think, very much. Um, now, to, to go back to the uh, second part of your question, I think illiberal regimes can be stable if the population is homogeneous, if there is no history of democracy in the country, and if their economy is not too tightly interwoven with the global economy. Uh, but um, that is not the case in Israel uh, at all. I think, uh, um, I mean, you, I, I go back to one point I made earlier. Uh, what I, I think has kept Israeli Arabs um, pretty quiet, I think, and fairly dutiful uh, citizens, is the fact that they enjoyed the perks of democracy. Imperfect democracy, but still a much better democracy than they could have had. And I think we can expect that they will no longer be such a dutiful citizen, nor should they, if Israel ceases to be a democracy. So that's uh, one point. Then I think um, Israel lives on a model where religious people do not work. 15% uh, of the population actually does not work and is sustained by the involvement of Israel in a global economy, for example, the high-tech industry. This model will not be able to sustain itself, I think, obviously, um, uh, um, if Israel ceases to uh, become uh, a democracy. I think Jewish philanthropy will w uh, dwindle. I think uh, Jews from all over the world will stop coming. I think you will see a slow immigration of Israelis outside uh, the country. And the country will no longer be able to sustain uh, itself, at least certainly not the way it has done so far. So in the Israeli context, I believe that the model will not be sustainable. OK, thank you. Actually, that's a good bridge to uh, the question I wanted to ask you, Daniel. One unique feature of Israel's foreign relations is this connection between the Jewish state and Jewish communities beyond its borders. Uh, diaspora Jewish communities are extremely varied, but relations with Israel, especially 
in the largest diaspora community, the US, with its overwhelmingly liberal and democratic voting Jewish population, have been much more disputatious in recent decades. Now this relationship will be even more conflicted. You recently authored a joint letter calling on US Jews to speak up a bit more loudly against the Israeli government's legislative attack on democracy. And you addressed a closed door APAC meeting in which you described why it was going to be so tough for anyone committed to liberal values to sell Israel on Capitol Hill. How far is this an unprecedented moment for Israel's foreign relations with US Jews and other diaspora communities? How bad could it get? And does Netanyahu really care? Also, a lot of questions. It's a bouquet of great questions. I want to just clarify one thing before that ever said, um, which is, I think we, it's very important because especially this, this misunderstanding will play into the relationship between Israel and American Jews, not to lump all religious Jews together. There are people in the religious community who think that God is, this is part of a plan and God is on their side. Uh, the religious community in which I live, which is not a tiny community, doesn't think anything of that. So I think it's just very important to make clear that religious Jews in Israel are like Christians in America. They come in all sorts of different forms. They believe all sorts of different things. They may on the outside look a little similar, though they don't even look all that similar. Um, so some of the characteristics that I would describe quite accurately are, are very important, but I think they mostly apply to a certain slice of the religious community and not the religious community as a whole. Now, I wrote a book, as you, as you uh, noted or didn't note, I don't remember if you said it or not, called We Stand Divided, in which I argued that American-Jewish relationship is basically built on a fundamental misunderstanding one of the other. And I think that both American-Jewish leadership and Israeli leadership have had for a very long time an incentive to paper over the profound differences between the two countries. They both wanted American-Jewish support to go from America to Israel. They both wanted a, a nice, smooth relationship, and so therefore it was important to talk about Thomas Jefferson and, and David Ben-Gurion, that it was important to talk about their Declaration of Independence and our Declaration of Independence, which ironically the first draft was actually taken from Jefferson's words. But at the end of the day, while most countries in the world don't have purposes, France doesn't have a purpose. Uh, England doesn't have a purpose. When I've talked in England or in France about the purpose of countries, people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, in England they say, well, what's our purpose, the Magna Carta? I mean, that, in other words, America was founded as a clear experiment in a new kind of governance that Thomas Jefferson and others hoped would become a universal model. And for a while, Francis Fukuyama and others, it looked like it was actually working. Uh, it was a universal model. Give me your tired, your poor, your hungry, masses yearning to breathe free and so forth. Israel was not that. Israel was, according to the Balfour Declaration, Her Majesty's in government, etc., a, a national home for the Jewish people. If the American Declaration of Independence begins uh, when in the course of human events, Israel's Declaration of Independence begins by saying the land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. They had certain very significant commonalities including a certain diversity of population, including democratic organisms and so on and so forth. But they were countries created for very different purposes. And I think to a certain extent what we're seeing now is that these differences are bubbling to the surface. They have been for a while. As you noted, this is not new. This is just kind of the apex. And um, it is going to get very dark out there. It is going to get very, very dark. Now you ask how bad could this get? That depends almost entirely on what happens here in Israel. If six weeks, three months, five months from now, we find ourselves in a situation where you can't call Israel anything that other than either a non-democracy or an illiberal democracy, well, then it's over. I mean, there will be certain American Jewish organizations that will still manage to stagger along and feed off a very small percentage of the people that used to contribute. Uh, but the heart will be sucked out of all of the, the sense of, you know, APAC, the federations, the Anti-Defamation League, which has been supportive of Israel. I mean, there's, there's almost a limitless number of groups, Hadassah. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Um, the, the, they might stagger along for a while because or, you know, organizations look at the Histad root. I mean, the organizations have capacities to sort of keep going, the Jewish agency. They exist because they perpetuate themselves, but it'll be without without any of the sense of soulfulness, without any of the sense of passion. That's the worst case scenario, that Israel becomes either a non-democracy or an illiberal democracy. Now, it's very stupid in this current situation to make a prediction, but I will do so nonetheless. Excellent. And I hope that I will not be proven wrong, because my prediction is 
is that we will have judicial reform, but we will not have the judicial reform the uh, Reeve Levin and, and uh, Rothman, for example, put forth. There will be some version of it. Many people acknowledge that judicial reform is in place to a degree. So my hope and my prayer is that um, whatever judicial reform we get ultimately actually improves the system and doesn't damage it. And even if it goes a little further than I might personally like it to go, it will not go beyond the point that one has to say this is now an illiberal democracy. Uh, here I want to agree completely with what Eva said. It is completely unsustainable. In other words, an illiberal democracy in Israel, or even a democracy that's perceived as illiberal by its citizens, is completely un unsustainable. You see, even within the last couple of weeks, uh, special forces units saying, not going to do what I'm ordered to do. Reserve soldiers saying, I'm not going to get called up. Now, Hertz Yalevi, who's the new IDF chief of staff, who's got a much rougher job than he thought he had, was going to have, and he thought it was going to be a hard job, he said, you know, don't get uniforms involved in this. And that's understandable. That's the right thing for him to say at this moment. But people care about their lives, and people are not going to sacrifice their lives, and parents are not going to encourage their children to join units in which they have to sacrifice their lives for a country that they're not proud of, for a country in which they're not certain that their grandchildren will have a vote. It's not sustainable economically. It's not sustainable in terms of the relationship with Washington, D.C. It's not sustainable militarily. I agree with Eva completely. It's not sustainable with the Arab population. It's just not sustainable. I think what, what, we're, what we're witnessing here is, um, as Eva pointed out, the, the founding fathers, and they were really mostly fathers, there were a few women involved too, but the founding fathers of this country represented the Labor Party, which, if I'm not mistaken, in 1949, in the first elections that Israel had, got 46 seats in the Knesset, and the Labor Party got four in the last, in the last election. Now, parties have shifted and split and all of that. but. We're hyper-secularist Ashkenazi Judaism is kind of in its last gasps uh, because it is not offered a compelling vision of the Jewishness of the Jewish state. But isn't that the kind of identity that most liberal uh, American Jews identify with? Correct. And that's the challenge to the left in Israel. The challenge to the left in Israel is to not leave the playing field of Jewish vocabulary to people like Smotrich and Ben Gvir. If you're a person, just look back at the last election on November 1st. If you're a person who's what I would call you know, a modern religious person, but you want to vote for somebody who's got that Jewish soul and they speak about Jewishness, who were your choices in this election? Lapid, perfectly honorable guy, doesn't really talk about it. Gans, perfectly honorable guy, his whole life devoted to the Jewish state, doesn't talk about it. Bibi, doesn't talk about it, doesn't walk the walk, doesn't talk the talk. Who were your choices? Your choices were Ben Gvir or Smotrich. That is the fault of the center and the left. The center and the left have been kind of blind and deaf to the fact that their pulses within, particularly in the Mizrahi population, to which Eva pointed so correctly, a very different kind of profound religiosity and passion. Either the left is going to be able to, and by left I mean here left center, I agree the left is gone, but the left center, uh, either it's going to be able to come up with a vision for Israel that is profoundly democratic, but also meaningfully Jewish, beyond speaking Hebrew and observing the Jewish calendar in some sort of amorphous national way. But really, what's Jewish about this country? If they can't speak to that, they are not sustainable. And then this right, which as I said before, I personally consider an anathema, an affront, the, actual, the absolute opposite of all of the values on which this country was created, they will stay in power a little bit longer. But the fact that they will stay in power will not make Israel sustainable or, or, or viable. It'll just simply become, as I've said, it'll, it'll leak money, it'll leak military power, it'll leak international support, it'll leak a relationship with American Jews. Uh, and you will find an Israel that can't defend itself against Palestinians if there's an uprising. You'll find an Israel that certainly cannot defend itself without American support against an Iran that's planning to go nuclear. You'll find an Israel that will become, tragically, over the course of time, not all that dissimilar to the poor, not highly educated Yishuv that was here before people began to come 150 years ago. Now, we're not anywhere near that yet, but that's the direction, and that's what's so tragic. So it's not sustainable. The worst case scenario with American Jews is an absolute break, except for a few hardcore people on both sides, which will not sustain those great national organizations. It'll be completely over. Um, but again, I think we ought to be optimistic, at least try to be, in this very painful time in our history, and say that the reforms will probably be watered down. There probably will be compromise. We will be, a I hope, a democratic country with a shifted 
uh, judicial system, which may not be the one that I would have picked, but democratic enough, and that will be able to then rebuild. But the critical piece will be, have, even if that happens, will we have heard the warning bells? Will we have seen the red blinking lights? Will the center in Israel say, we got very close to being in a very bad place? Now, there's a huge population here of people that want something different from what we've been selling for a very long time. If we escape danger this time, what are we going to offer so that in future elections we fare much better? Okay, Susan, for the last question, uh, after that uh, potential prophecy of uh, a real chasm between Israel and uh, US Jews, uh, more about Israel's potential chasm with the US itself and the administration. <clears throat> Just to take a step sideways for a second, some um, observers had expected that Donald Trump's uh, dinner with Nick Fuentes, the far-right anti-Semite, <clears throat> would be um, a milestone moment where he became too toxic even for his admirers. And that didn't happen, and now is Trump, off, Trump is off riffering about warmongering globalists again. But is there a red line that Netanyahu and his far-right anti-Arab, pro-settler, theocratic, you know, add the adjective that you want, government, could cross that would mean Biden would have to act. You know, there's been a little bit of a jostling uh, so far, a comment here, a comment there, a couple of uh, uh, strong, uh, strongly, uh, um, almost strong uh, statements by Blinken and by Biden. Um, you know, one uh, comment by the U.S. ambassador, which was really quite mild, led to an Israeli government minister telling him that America should mind its own business. But when does Israel's business become America's too? And is there a point where the U.S. would say, is this still worth it for us? Should we now recalibrate? Well, I think I want to challenge a little bit uh, the idea that uh, this would be such a huge rupture, even if... Uh, kind of the full extreme version of judicial reform were to pass. I, you know, the, the truth is that Israel has become a partisan issue in the United States in recent years uh, in the way that many other issues that previously weren't so much have. And, you know, right now, I, I would say that the Republican Party gives every indication of largely being what you might call a Christian nationalist party, even if some of its leaders like Donald Trump personally, you know, don't um, have that much adherence, uh, you know, to that kind of ideology. Uh, you know, Trump has made a very clear transactional kind of arrangement with uh, that core of the Republican Party's electorate when he was president and would certainly be comfortable doing so again. So I, I don't actually subscribe to the idea that uh, uh, Israel taking an illiberal turn would mean an absolute rupture with the United States, at least if Republicans were to return to power or to hold uh, a substantial part of the U.S. government. First of all, the United States over time has more than uh, expressed a willingness to work with uh, uh, illiberal leaders and even outright uh, dictators. Uh, and uh, a, the possibility of Israel, in a way, becoming uh, just another Middle East country uh, is one that I can understand would be enormously upsetting and dismaying to many people inside Israel itself, as well as to many in the United States who believed uh, in the idea of Israel as this beacon of democracy in the region, uh, who who still care about that as the future for Israel. But um, the United States uh, is pretty calculating in the end, and uh, you know its national interests. Uh, might dictate or might not dictate uh, working with an Israel uh, that didn't have the same kind of liberal democracy as its organizing principles. So I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that it would be a fundamental isolation and rupture uh, in relations between Israel and the United States uh, as much as uh, we might think that ought to be the case. The Republican Party today uh, you know, really has shown a willingness to accept the uh, almost previously unthinkable in terms of views inside the United States, so certainly uh, probably is willing to do so. It's also become a kind of uh, a touchstone for many Republican politicians to offer 
uh, at least publicly, a kind of uncritical support for Israel. And that is an element almost of our domestic politics. So again, I think you're looking at very different approaches from Democrats and Republicans to Israel because that is uh, already the case. And I think that does put the Biden administration uh, in a very awkward situation right now. Um, I agree that the criticism has been mild. Uh, you know, one comment about, quote, pumping the gr brakes uh, from Ambassador Tom Nides is not exactly harsh public criticism. And, uh, you know, again, I think the issue there is forcing its way onto the agenda of Washington at a time when there are so many other foreign policy crises. And, uh, you know, again, what are you prepared to do? How are you prepared to follow through? I've been struck by the fact that as much as the United States has really turned its foreign policy focus to the war in Ukraine over the last year, you've seen uh, senior officials in the Biden administration reluctant uh, to be more critical of Israel for, for not providing more support to Ukraine. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, dismayed uh, or concerned about that, but uh, essentially willing to just kind of focus on other matters when it comes to uh, the public presentation. Uh, so you could definitely see a more overt fraying of relations between Democratic officials. And right now we do have a Democratic president uh, in office and a Democratic Senate. But I just would be wary of uh, making the assumption and uh, putting out there publicly the idea that uh, Washington uh, would undergo some kind of a rupture with Israel as a result of this, because unfortunately, uh, I don't see that that is where the Republican Party in the United States is right now. And uh, that's our own uh, crisis of democracy, small d, is that uh, we have uh, uh, one of our two political parties that is struggling and divided within itself over uh, even very basic questions uh, of support for democracy. And again, look at the willingness of American Republicans uh, to uh, not only work with, but even to celebrate illegal, illiberal leaders, uh, such as those in Poland and Hungary in particular. Uh, uh, they've made almost a, you know that an element of uh, the extreme right uh, conservatism uh, in in the United States today, and they celebrate Victor Orban. And so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't count that out from happening uh, if this is the direction that Israel fundamentally takes as well. Do you think you know the idea of red lines is obviously not very fashionable or perhaps even advisable to use? But is it more likely that uh, let's say for the Democratic the Democratic Party and for Biden those red lines would relate to? Uh, something that could be understood as internal affairs, such as whether a country stays democratic or not? Or would it be something more like occupation, uh, annexation, uh, formalizing the status of Israel's control of the territories, or of you know, an explosive violence uh, that might engulf uh, this part of the world? Yeah, I think you're right to um, ask that question because historically, of course, the United States has been reluctant to uh, uh, be seen as interfering in the uh, internal fights, no matter how uh, divisive or uh, threatening they are to basic principles of the democracy. So I do think it's, you know, the issue of, of violence, a new intifada, uh, some kind of potentially irreversible legal step like annexation that would uh, probably get Washington's attention uh, uh, or, you know, see more specific steps being taken, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, so that's my guess is that, uh, you know, something that inarguably had to be paid attention to uh, is, is more likely given uh, all the other issues that are on uh, the White House's plate right now. But, um, you know, again, uh, we're just in a very inward looking moment in which our own crisis uh, of democracy uh, continues to remain unresolved. And I know, you know, you've probably seen lots of attention to the idea that, well, you know, uh, the air has leaked out of the Trump balloon since our midterm elections in, in November. He's he's not strong. There are Republicans willing to criticize him. That is all true to a certain extent. But I would also point out that at this moment, Trump remains 
uh, the leader and the front runner to become the Republican nominee in 2024. It's not even entirely clear yet that um, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, would actually run against him. He's perceived to be the only uh, serious contender against Trump in the Republican primary. And uh, more to the point of this conversation, seems determined uh, not to break with uh, Trump's politics, but simply to uh, try to take uh, Trump's own voters from him and to be, in a way, more Trumpy than Trump in terms of uh, his his approach to politics. So that doesn't necessarily suggest a sharp uh, break. And again, the trajectory I see with the Republican Party in the U.S. when it comes to Israel certainly is a very, very high threshold of tolerance for uh, uh, even extremely uh, illiberal and threatening uh, measures. So that's where uh, something like violence, a new war in the region, uh, a new uh, legal step that uh, couldn't be ignored, those are probably the more likely triggers for American action. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Eva. Uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Yevgeny Kolnichuk, thank you for being with us today at the Haaretz Foreign Affairs Conference. I'd like to take you back a year, the morning or early morning of February the 24th. Where were you? I was in my residence in Hirslia, and uh, of course we, we didn't sleep well because it was uh, uh, quite a, a lot of warnings uh, previously. Uh, back to 24th of uh, February. You remember when the uh, foreign embassies withholded their offices from Kyiv one month to two weeks before the aggression started. And then it was direct warnings from our US and European partners. But still, I wouldn't believe that this situation will happen in real life. Because for me, it sounds completely unrealistic. It doesn't have any logic under it. But uh, then you realize, if you look back, that you don't necessarily have to look for the logic. So what was the moment where you realized, I'm now the representative of a country at war? Five o'clock in the morning, I wake my, up my son that lives with me. I told him he is 17, and I told him that the war is started. What are you hearing at that moment from your bosses from the foreign ministry in Kiev? No communications at that moment? No communication at all. And you start your day, you have to represent Ukraine. What's the first thing that you're asking from the country that you're, that you're stationed in from Israel? Listen, I, I, I'm just looking retrospectively on the situation and uh, my phone was silent for the last week or two. It was no communication. It was just the volunteers, the people and the companies and the NGOs from Israel that wanted to donate and bring help. It was the soldiers and the officers who uh, retired to, from, the going to volunteer. from the Israeli army that want to volunteer and go to Ukraine. So we sent one of the first planes. We sent with, uh, I could not tell you the number, but it was a substantial number of the volunteers. I remember I met, I met, I met them in Ukraine that have got to a the month later. Who were, they were already there in the fighting. So yes. the Israel was, I think, the second day of war. We sent the plane full of, of the Israelis that volunteered. So you're describing a situation where Israeli society, civil society, NGOs, individuals are trying to do everything they can, including volunteering to go and fight for Ukraine. And you said for a week you didn't hear from the Israeli government. More than a week. Uh, ret retrospectively, I will say that uh, they all tell us, you, are, you are was a good guy. Ciao, Bella. That's how I felt. But I didn't realize that immediately. Well, when you look on that situation retrospectively, that's what you think about. But uh, obviously speaking, I do understand that uh, the Israeli government shared the view of the U.S. intelligence that we could not sustain more than a week as a country. 
And this is why, you know, they was very much surprised that the uh, Ukrainian ambassador is running around and uh, asking for aid. Uh, after weeks and then the months, and then uh, uh, all of a sudden I think that the field hospital that was sent to the western Ukraine, uh, that happened like about a month and a half since the war started. Later on, we learned from uh, Prime Minister Bennett interview that this decision have be been agreed with the Russian president. That I was very much surprised about that, of course. So when you heard, this is just a few weeks ago, when Naftali Bennett gave uh, a long interview summing up his not so long term in office, were you surprised, were you shocked by the, by the level of coordination that he had at the time with uh, President Putin? Well, this is not, a, this is not the right word. Uh, of course, it, it's, uh, I, I felt sorry for, for him and uh, we was kind of surprised because, again, we knew that he don't understand uh, the motivation of the Russian forces and the Russian president. So save Zelensky's life is not something that he will care at all. So let me just clarify. Bennett said in this interview that Putin said to him, don't worry, I am not going to eliminate uh, President Zelensky. Now, Bennett also said that he was talking to Zelensky all this time and that he, there was some type of request from Zelensky for him to be talking to Putin. Is that, is that accurate? This is accurate. And uh, sometimes they were talking a few times a day. I didn't even know how many times they speak directly on the phone. So these are in the first weeks of the warfare. The Israeli Prime Minister Bennett was talking daily with Zelensky. What is not accurate is that he uh, took the credit for himself that because of he agreed that with Putin, Zelensky go out from the bunker. That's, this is not true. <laughs> Zelensky was out uh, three days after the war started uh, openly, and you can check it through the public uh, records. But you know, Israel was explaining at the time that we, Israel has to act differently than, other, than the Western countries because the, the Russians are in Syria, there are concerns for the big Jewish communities in Russia and in Ukraine. What did you think of these explanations? I think this is all very bad excuses from the Israeli government. Uh, and to a certain time they are reiterating to say that even now, after the year of war. Uh, so it was the different types of excuses. Uh, the Russians are our neighbors in Syria, which is not true anymore, because of they withholded most of their troops. Uh, after a few months of the war, they moved them all to, to Ukraine. So now you don't have to coordinate. Uh, secondly, uh, that we are worry for the big Jewish community in Russia. And normally I'm retaliating saying that, listen, how about the Jewish community in Ukraine? They suffer a lot. And uh, lots of the synagogues have been destroyed. Lots of the people have been replaced or killed uh, of the Jewish origin. What should you say about that? They, they have no answers. And the most you know, funny arguments that sometimes use your current prime minister, he said that we cannot give Ukraine the weapon or technologies because of it might appear in Iran. So you mentioned the current prime minister, you're talking about Benjamin Netanyahu. You have been here for nearly three years now and you've had twice Netanyahu, Bennett in the middle, Yair Lapid for six months and now again Netanyahu. Have you seen changes in Israeli government policy regarding Ukraine and Russia or is it, is it basically the same policy, whoever's been prime minister? Well, to tell you the truth, Israeli slowly changing its policy towards Ukraine. Unfortunately, uh, in this transition period, which was quite a long one, since uh, Bennett left and Lapid was not, he was in a transition, he wasn't able to make you know, substantial changes. And of course, the policy changing, uh, selling the technologies, uh, defensive technologies to Ukraine would be the policy changing. Uh, so he, he couldn't do it, but he promised, of course, and it was many promises made by Lapid. Unfortunately, we haven't seen lots of deliverables except of the humanitarian on the ground. 
but I'm keeping saying that again and again, that we are grateful for humanitarian aid, but you cannot win the war with the bandages and antibiotics. So we have here, and perhaps uh, yeah. we could show that we have a, a piece of an Iranian Shehad drone, which yeah. was intercepted by, uh, by Ukrainian air defense, right? Exactly. So we are getting them by hundreds per day sometime. And uh, this is a fairly cheap widget that uh, costs uh, approximately, you know, $10,000 but it can create a substantial damage, especially for the infrastructure. There is obviously a system that Israel could be supplying Iran. It isn't yet, but Israel is also supplying Ukraine with some types of intelligence through NATO, through the American, which have helped the Ukrainians. Listen, we are also the... supplying Israel with this type of intelligence on the matter. So there's a two-way, there's now of course, there's a two-way It was always exchange. two ways exchange. That never stops, but this is not enough. What I'm trying to say that now we are the champions in terms of the shutting down Iranian drones. And I brought the peace to Israel. This is the second one that I brought. The first one I already gifted to the Israeli government to, in order to show that Iran not just selling the drones to Russia. They are advancing those drones, drones because of they use Ukrainian war field as the place where they test their weapon. And this weapon can be used against Israel one day. So. We have a joint enemy, which means that, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's how I will attract the attention of the Israeli government, saying that they have to do more. Have you spoken to Prime Minister Netanyahu since his return to office? I personally didn't speak to Prime Minister Netanyahu, but I spoke to the head of the National Security Council. I spoke to various ministers that are close to, to him and uh, uh, influencing decisions. Uh, so I, I do believe that the message is clear. Israel have to step aside from neutrality, even on the issues of the defensive equipment. I wouldn't even call that the weapon, because you cannot kill uh, people or soldiers with the anti-missile system or anti-drone system. So, you can re save so the recently, life. President Zelensky uh, mentioned the David Sling, which is an Israeli air defense system. So this, this is what your security experts think that Ukraine could best uh, well, use? Well, it is a lot of the different things that Israel can help with. Most of the Israelis very well known Iron Dome, but it's, it's not uh, the best thing that you can get because in our situation, because we are not acting against handmade Palestinian and you're, rockets. And you're a much larger country, it's a different type of... Russia is using the different types of the rockets against us. It's against the ballistic missiles, unfortunately, the Iron Dome could do nothing. But it is a system called like Barak 8, for example, that uh, can be used for the multiple purposes and the other systems that are jointly produced with the Americans. But currently, the, the Israeli foreign minister, when he was just a, a couple of weeks ago in Kiev, spoke about helping with early warning systems. This is not an air defense, defense system. This is purely about. civilian matter. Which okay. you already have. No, we don't. Yeah. Unfortunately, our system is the old one. So basically, when, when you, uh, your uh, radars see the air, air fighter planes uh, shutting up from the Belarus territory or Russia territory, so the alarm is start to warn all over the place, in the old Kiev and Kiev Oblast, for example. So if you will get this uh, smart warning system, you will show sector alley where those missiles so this will, will well, This will be, be able to pinpoint where the incoming missiles are going yes. to impact and create less of a less of a need to shut down the entire country every time. Yes, there's, there's and an also alert. show the time, how much time people have in order to get to shelter. This is something you want to, Israel to supply and of Israel course. has agreed to, but this is still not air, actual air defense. This is civ civilian. This is civilian meta. And again, we, Israel says openly that we will supply it in November. And uh, now why, we are in, in... Why is it taking so long? <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> ask Israeli government. Uh, unfortunately, most of the, those people don't understand that we are in war. In most cruel war since probably the World War II, where the pe people are dying by hundreds per day sometime. So we need it yesterday. We cannot wait. Uh, it was also other civilian matters discussed, 
or like demining, for example. This is not a military issue. This is also basically helping, you know, civilian society to get rid of mines because Russians left, you know, hundreds of thousands of mines on, on, on these deoccupied ter territories. It was agreed that we will be getting those assistance from Israel and uh, you are producing certain equipment here that we can use. So uh, it was quite a few issues that was discussed. So in my visits to Ukraine uh, during the war over, over the last year, I've heard a very interesting kind of attitude towards Israel. On the one hand, people are saying, like you've been, why is Israel sending a, a weapon system? Why are we getting that kind of help for Israel? Why is Israel remaining neutral? And at the same time, it's very a, a high level of affinity with Israel. That people in Ukraine have been telling me, we need to be like Israel. We admire Israel. We feel like we are in the same situation that is here with Russia that the Israelis are in the Middle East. Can you explain that, that attitude? Uh, unfortunately, we find ourselves in much more difficult situation than Israel, at least those days, because of, again, it's the different types of missiles that Russia is hitting us. More general feeling, yes. Uh, more general feeling, I think we have to admire Ukrainian armed forces now that doing great job. And uh, if, you, if you're talking about the general issue and the picture, definitely you have to look on the Israel as a certain model that can be used in terms of the recruiting people, in terms of the training, in terms of the uh, building its own air defense system and uh, relying on himself. So Israel re not, don't rely on NATO, for example, or the other neighbors, maybe except of the strategic partner United States. But uh, otherwise, it was a good question, you know, that I, I discussed it with uh, many Israeli politicians. Why guy, don't you guys join NATO? And uh, this is the interesting you know, perspective. In our situation, yes, uh, the number of the Ukrainians that believe that Israel is a friend is still more than 50%. But unfortunately, this number has declined over the last year, simply because of Israel did not provide defensive equipment to Ukraine that we very much asked him to do so. And how significant do you see Iran's uh, support and alliance with Russia? How has it had a big influence on the, on the broader picture of the war? Of course. I think this, this is uh, the two ways road. When is Iran is supplying the drones, Russia is supplying Israel with uh, nuclear technologies. Yeah, it's like Iran. Yeah. And uh, this is the major threat to, to Israel, I believe. So while uh, you are talking about potential threat, we do have this threat on the ground every day. So our people being killed with those Iranian drones every single day. So this is a difference. But if we work together against the common enemy, that could make both countries stronger. And we're, we're talking uh, just a few days after President uh, Joe Biden visited Kiev. What, how did that make you feel, that moment of seeing the, the US president walking in, a, in sunny Kiev? It was good, good weather that day. I was so proud of our leadership, of all Ukrainian people that uh, saw our major, strongest partner, the United States, staying next to us uh, in such a difficult situation. Uh, I'm also glad to say that yesterday we has had a delegation from the Israeli Knesset and they were successfully having the meeting with the Ukrainian leadership. I think it was interesting that Zelensky had time to meet the President of the United States and a couple of members of Knesset from, from Israel. It this was... is his Jewish heart. He cannot avoid it. He, I, I could tell you that Israel have a very special kind of a place on his heart. But he seems very disappointed as well. He is very disappointed. He is very disappointed. He knows that we as an embassy do our best. But uh, frankly, I'm not joking when I'm saying that I cannot be successful ambassador of Ukraine to Israel because of my president is Jewish and he always want more from Israel <laughs> that Israel can ever deliver. We're entering a second year of war. Do you see in this year Israeli weapons, weapon systems well, being supplied to Ukraine or you think I, it's still... I, uh, in my position, I'm rather going to be optimistic or I will retire as an ambassador, okay? 
we are doing at most in order to change the Israeli position. I know that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is making a survey now and uh, talking to his military and uh, security advisors about changing the policy. I think this is going to be the policy changing because of the Iranian threat is our common enemy. So we do very much hope that this strategy will change. Uh, also, I want you to point out to the declaration that had been made by two uh, Knesset members yesterday in Kiev, that, that I believe first time ever is consistent with our position towards Israel. So you think that they're doing this perhaps with some kind of agreement from from Netanyahu, then it's not necessarily just their own policy. That they, we're talking here about Knesset members, Yuli Edelstein and, yeah, I, I, and Zev Elkin, who have just been to Kiev and I, I very came much out with a very so. strong statement. I, I very much hope so, but uh, they are not a members of the government. Uh, even though they are influential in the, at the Knesset, the government have to change the position. And I, I hope that's going to be the case. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kornichuk, for joining us. I hope that next time we talk there'll be better news to talk about coming out from Ukraine and hopefully from Israel as well. And thank you for joining us for a panel on Israel and the new Cold War. As the war in Ukraine enters its second year, it's clear by now that this is not a regional conflict just between Russia and Ukraine, but part of a much larger battle for democracy and freedom that involves countries all over the world. And today, with a great team of experts, we're going to ask what is Israel's role in this battle? Where do we stand? What have been the implications for world Jewry as well? Uh, how is this war affecting the Middle East at large? A lot, of interesting issues to, a lot of interesting issues to discuss. And with us a great panel today, former Mossad chief Ephraim Alevi. Hello Ephraim, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Amos Arel, our national security uh, and defense analyst at Haaretz. Hi Amos. Hi. Ksenia Svetlova, former member of Knesset, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And Yair Navod, a journalist and analyst, formerly the uh, uh, Israeli public broadcaster's correspondent in Moscow. Hi, Yair. Hi, hello. Um, so we'll get to everything right away. Ephraim, I want to start with you. As we are marking this one-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, are you surprised by where, where the war is standing today? Because when it started, <laughs> I remember a lot of smart people saying Putin will take Kiev in a week. I won't say that I guessed in advance that uh, what happened uh, was going to happen, but there was something which uh, was a first step before the war broke out, which was very unique, and that was the visit to Moscow of the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, who I happen to know quite well. And he, for the first time, used intelligence in a way that has never been used before. He came to tell President Putin that uh, if he launched the war, he would probably not win it. And he put the facts on the table. And therefore, throughout this year, I was saying to myself, Bill Burns did something which uh, has never been done before, but it was also very, very, very unique and very, very useful and uh, produced the ultimate result. So, yes. I was, not, I was surprised because I didn't know what was behind it in terms of the substance, but the war began in a very strange and unorthodox manner. And when Bill Burns did that, by the way, uh, I think a lot of people maybe were skeptical, but the events have proven him right. Absolutely. And it has shown that uh, intelligence, uh, as of then, has changed dramatically over this last year in many ways. And even today, as we... Uh, mark the first anniversary, intelligence's gain is playing a very big role. And uh, what's going to happen the second year already is a different story than the second year in any other war. So, Xenia, I want to turn to you. You've become one of the most prominent uh, analysts discussing this on Israeli television in the last year. And when you look back at the first days of the war and where we stand today, what has been the biggest surprise factor for you? Well, um, I think that uh, what was most surprising for me uh, is, of course, the um, unbelievable steadfast of the, of the Ukrainians. Um, I knew that the army was rebuilt and it was actually reborn uh, since 2014, since the annexation of Crimea. And yet, uh, I think that 
again, it was hard to expect to what degree uh, they had changed, how uh, uh, centralized uh, everybody were uh, around the central leadership uh, and, uh, you know, the army command, and how effective they were. I think that it was a pleasant surprise in all of this. There were a lot of fears. Um, I was uh, very frightful when, uh, you know, the American intelligence was talking about taking Kiev in three days, losing Kiev in three days, and Zelensky uh, was offered a refuge, I remember my heart was pounding. When, because when we heard these stories that Biden wanted to invite him yes. maybe to Washington, or maybe he would go to London or Poland. Yes, and uh, you know, uh, I said, well, you know, if Ukraine will fall, everybody will fall, Moldova, the Baltics, perhaps Poland as well, who knows? Uh, but this is something that you know, if this would happen, it's like a domino effect. And in a few days, I just went over my Twitter, uh, Twitter uh, uh, from the last year, um, when, you know, we saw our, our after hour, how it unfolds, it became very clear that the Ukrainians are not what the world used to think about. I want to turn to you and ask, what, are, what have been the biggest lessons for Israel so far in this first year of the war? And you covered this both on the diplomatic level, when there has been a lot of controversy around Israel's position in the war, and also from the military point of view. Going back to what Ephraim and uh, Ksani have mentioned, uh, part of this was the fact that the Israelis, like most um, analysts around the world, got this uh, absolutely wrong. Uh, the general feeling in the beginning was that it wouldn't take uh, Putin too much time to take control of Kiev, that he could uh, manage uh, a surprise, not exactly a surprise attack, but a commando, an elite attack, which would end in either uh, killing or uh, arresting uh, Zelensky, and that that would be the end of the story. This was the intelligence was, estimate on our side. That was, at least that was the general sentiment. Whenever I talked to uh, generals on the Israeli side for the first uh, week or two, it was quite clear that this is what they were expecting. And they were yet under the impression of what the uh, Russians managed to do here in Syria when they helped the uh, Assad regime in 2015. It turned out, of course, that the Ukrainians were a much uh, a better opponent, more equipped, more willing to fight than anybody maybe, else in, in Maybe in, the in Ukrainians saw what happened in Syria and realized some lessons from Perhaps that. that's true as well. Um, after a year, this is a very different war. Uh, for many uh, years, uh, analysts spoke of, uh, of the change in wars and the fact that you will not have, again, a case in which uh, uh, big militaries will fight each other in so-called industrial wars, tank against tank, and so on. And suddenly we're discussing now how uh, Germany and other European countries would supply the Ukrainians with more tanks. And we will see more tanks fighting each other uh, within a few uh, weeks. So, in a way, we, we went back a little. It's more, um, 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 it might remind you of some of the previous uh, wars as, as well. But I think the greatest lesson of them all, and this is something that Ksenia has already alluded to, is that the willingness to fight. In the end, the fact that the Ukrainians felt that they were right about this, that they were defending their own country, that, that they had every right to do anything by any means necessary to stop the Russians from invading their country, this was the most important issue. And this is, uh, the reasons why the uh, um, uh, Russians uh, were prevented from uh, fulfilling their uh, plans. It, it may end differently. We will have to see how the second uh, year evolves. But other than that, it's quite clear that the Ukrainians' willingness to fight has changed the course of this war. And a few words about Israel from the beginning, basically a policy of neutrality in this war. Yes, it was under Bennett and then Lapid and now Netanyahu. But in the end, you cannot see a real difference between the three uh, different prime ministers on this. Uh, all three uh, feared the Russian response. All three are perfectly aware of the fact that we have the Russian presence here in uh, northwest Syria. Uh, that we should uh, tread lightly because we have a, a bear, a giant bear at our back door, so to speak, and try to avoid taking sides. I think by now, after a year, a year, it's quite clear that from a moral point of view, Israel should do much more than that. And suddenly you hear different voices, not exactly among the coalition, but for instance, uh, um, former minister Zev Elkin, who just came back from the Ukraine, uh, spoke differently about the need to give the uh, Ukrainians uh, military assistance, and not only for defensive um, uh, goals, but also uh, things that could help them actually attack the Russians. This is a gradual change. I don't think that Netanyahu is, is there yet, but I think that the more we hear, the more frustration we hear from both Zelensky and the international community about Israel's role, the more there's a chance that Israel would finally do more for Ukraine than it is doing right now.
Interesting, and we'll get back to this in a second. Yeah, I want to ask you, um, Amos mentioned the Israeli fears of the big Russian bear. Uh, has Russia been exposed here as a fragile empire? Um, maybe some of the fears are exaggerated? Yeah, it looks like that, because I think we need to remember after what we saw uh, in Syria, we were quite impressed. People were impressed with the, with the level of the, <coughs> the Russian military, how they operated. And uh, I think there was a sense of, uh, of fear and that one day this big machine, military machine, uh, will show its force. And uh, a lot of people thought before Ukraine that this is what we're going to see. But uh, actually, all this huge uh, budget that went into the Russian army disappeared somewhere in, in the, on the way. And what we saw eventually was uh, a big Russian army which uh, didn't operate as we thought before. Um, and I think um, it was very, very clear uh, after around two weeks or so that this is something different. And, uh, and the, the, the Russian army is, uh, I wouldn't say uh, weak, but for sure not strong as we thought before. Uh, it was very obvious. Uh, you, could, you could see, you could, you could uh, see all the videos from Ukraine, how, uh, how the Russians sent tanks on, main, on the main roads, like targets, clear targets to the Ukrainians. Something obviously was very wrong there. Um, and I think it also helped the Ukrainians to overcome this fear and um, manage to, uh, to change the picture dramatically within two or three months. So Xenia, uh, connecting to what Yair said, the Ukrainians overcame their fear, but it seems, and this also connects to what Amos mentioned, that Israel on the diplomatic level is still very fearful of Russia. Although we did see Foreign Minister Eli Cohen visit Kiev uh, a few weeks ago the overall strategy has not shifted yet. Uh, exactly, and I think this dilemma, uh, it was very present in, during Cohen's visit uh, to Ukraine, when he uh, uh, visited Bucha, where horrific war crimes were uh, committed, and this is that something that was already stipulated by the United Nations uh, and other international organizations, and uh, while uh, expressing sympathy uh, with the victims, still the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, he fell short of mentioning the perpetrator. Yeah, he didn't say the Russia. word Russia or Putin. Russia or, or yeah. Putin or Russian army or anything, uh, you know, of this. Uh, so we are still trying to work the fine line. We are still trying to, you know, like uh, uh, be nice with each side uh, without offending uh, too much. Uh, I do not uh, believe that uh, this line uh, can eventually change significantly. There could be a few, you know, things here and there uh, that uh, Israel, uh, under Netanyahu, or any other prime minister for this fact, it could be, you know, Benny Gantz or anybody else, but I don't think, don't see the red line changing uh, so much because uh, the problem was with, you know, basically having this red line from the very beginning. Israel, uh, since the very beginning, basically said to itself, this is as far that I'm willing to go. Yes to humanitarian aid, uh, yes to maybe treating the Ukrainians in our hospitals. We did it for Syrians, after all, so why not for <coughs> Ukrainians? But rather than that, nothing. Of course, after one year, it's extremely difficult to change any of this because it became rigid. The structure that we created with our own hands became very rigid. And even if people within the you know, defense system understand very well now that Russia, yes, it is still a bear. It's not a, a, a paper tiger, uh, but it's also not the uh, monster, you know, that uh, we should be fearing uh, and uh, risking uh, our uh, alliance uh, with the global West, with, uh, with the collective West. Uh, so this is something that is, uh, you know, if, as an Israeli, it frightens me a lot because it's not only a question of whether we will be uh, selling to Ukrainians these kind of types of weapons or not. Where do we belong? If we are looking at the global alliances as this uh, alliance of the uh, bad and the good, We're, you know, if you are looking at the United mm -hmm. Nations, yeah, if you are looking at North Korea and Iran and Belarus standing with Russia, yes, we are voting with the rest of the world. But where are we when we are actually needed? And this is a question that also connects, I think, to some of the internal debates that are happening in Israel right now, even though it's a foreign policy one, because it reflects on questions of uh, liberal democracy versus other kinds of uh, values and systems of government. Uh, Ephraim, I want to pose a similar question to you. When you look at the government, <coughs> and it's like Amos said, three prime ministers, but the, go the government really has continued um, with these uh, um, approaches toward the war. Um, do you think we're making a mistake here, or do you see the logic of uh, not uh, getting uh, Mr. Putin too angry? 
I think that uh, one of the questions is, uh, what will the, the next few months bring? And uh, a few days ago, there was a very interesting broadcast uh, of The Economist on this. Uh, in one of their um, uh, appearances, they have a, a regularly, they have a, uh, a, uh, a um, opportunity to watch them talking and so forth. They have a very brilliant uh, military uh, expert called Shashank Joshi, uh, who is head of their military desk and who has a very, very uh, good reputation in the past. Uh, he uh, served in uh, the Rusi uh, uh, um, center in London, and he is a man of uh, a lot of knowledge and he, they have a lot of sources. Uh, he uh, was very confident in saying that he thought that uh, despite the fact that you uh, put in uh, uh, more or less uh, let it to be uh, believed that he had uh, formed a new army of over 100,000 people, that this is not the case, that there is not such an army of 100,000 people, and therefore um, the next few months will not be a major uh, uh, offensive, certainly not of the uh, scope that they began with a year ago. And uh, this, of course, means to say not that the uh, war is going to end tomorrow morning, but it also means to say that uh, they will have to uh, uh, think better than they thought before as to how they go about. And one of the things that obviously they have been trying to mend is their relationship with China. And China, that could be a supplier of weaponry and maybe even uh, in certain circumstances uh, military forces, although I don't believe that the Chinese will be very happy to send military forces to Russia, and I don't think that the Russians would like the, uh, uh, shall we say, the uh, shame of having to have Chinese uh, soldiers to fight for them. And therefore, I think the options that uh, are in front of uh, Putin are uh, very, very grim. Uh, he's a very good actor. He's an extremely good actor. He knows how to act the way he speaks in uh, private meetings and also in public. But I think that uh, it is not a foregone conclusion that the next year will be a year in which we will have a similar uh, major offensive of the kind we saw a year ago. Interesting. Uh, Amos, when you hear these uh, expectations <laughs> and the forecast about the military movements, um, that reminds me that one of the biggest issues here in Israel regarding the war in Ukraine has been the question of should Israel supply all kind of defensive systems to the Ukrainians. There has been discussion of Iron Dome and David Sling. Uh, has there been any progress on that front? And do the Ukrainians really need these systems from Israel? I mean, they're getting so much help from the United States and other countries right now. I think there's been a slight progress and we may see, may hear some good news uh, regarding that in good news for, next, for, for, for Ukraine in, yeah, for in Ukraine. the next uh, few weeks. <coughs> it's not going to go very far, but going back to your uh, question, some of this is symbolic. You have to remember that Zelensky is Jewish, that he has a special relationship or a special um, um, the way he sees Israel, and he still mm -hmm. thinks, it may seem strange to some of us, but he still sees an importance <coughs> in the moral support of the state of Israel when uh, he considers uh, the, the fight for, for the survival of Ukraine. If you, you may compare that to 1967 or 1948. Mm -hmm. So he wants the symbolic uh, help of Israel. And this is why he kept mentioning uh, issues like Iron Dome and even David Sling, that's not really practical in any way. There's a one or two systems, it's not something that Israel could deliver to anybody else. When you talk about Iron Dome, Iron Dome is a trademark by now. People talk about that for 11, 12 years, there's the success of the Israeli technology and so on. The Israeli army uh, answers quite bluntly that they need all the batteries they have. And if, and, and we've seen in recent times how quickly things can escalate here, mm -hmm. We need them for the defense of Israel. We saw it two years ago in the That's war uh, with Gaza at the time that basically the Within US had to resupply and, Israel and immediately after it ended. That was re regarding the actual intercepting rockets, but also there's a question of how many batteries you deploy. And most of them you need in the case of war in Gaza, but if war breaks uh, with Iran or with Hezbollah, then you need all the help you can get. So uh, Israel is not keen on supplying those 
uh, systems. Then there's quite a lot of other things that are not necessarily lethal or what they call uh, kinetic uh, weapons. For instance, it has been talked about for ages now, Israel could um, give them help regarding their alarm system. Right now what happens is that whenever uh, a drone, um, Iranian attack drones are uh, uh, flying over Kiev or uh, all kinds of cruise missiles are, are sent in that direction, all of Kiev goes underground because everybody fears the, the result. Now, you live uh, across the border from Gaza, you're quite familiar with the fact that whenever there's an alarm, it can be around two or three kibbutzim and that's it, and everybody else can continue sleeping because the Israeli army has uh, become that good in, 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 uh, in realizing in advance where the actual missile is about to, to land. So if we can supply them with that kind of system, which is not a big deal to do, that could help them quite a lot. There are also uh, discussions of, um, for instance, all kinds of systems that can jam GPSs in order for to make the other side, uh, the other side's attacks less accurate. Uh, there is talk of supplying them with intelligence regarding the Iranian drones. All of these things are beginning to happen, but not at the rate and not as quickly as the Ukrainians have, uh, have hoped. If I may want to comment on, on that. <clears throat> yes, I think there's one aspect of this, Amos, which is also worthy of mention. And the fact that uh, uh, Russia has found it necessary to receive uh, support from Iran in the form of the UAVs. Uh, the, the fact that it is taking su support from a country like Iran shows uh, uh, the degree of weakness that they have reached. Hmm. And the fact that the, in the end these uh, UAVs have not been very, very effective in creating any change uh, uh, in the field and uh, they have uh, not uh, changed the, the, the the turn of the of the uh, of the direction that the hostilities are going to take, and uh, this again is something which is 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 worthy of mention. And one other thing is worthy of mention, and we have not mentioned it up to now, was that Putin made a very fatal mistake when he met uh, the Chinese uh, president uh, days before the launch. He launched the attack, and obviously he did not uh, tell his uh, very close ally that he was going to war within a few days. And the China had a very big stake in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine supplied a large uh, quantity of wheat to uh, China uh, regularly, uh, yearly. There were 6,000 uh, uh, Chinese students in Kiev on the day that the war broke out. And he didn't think it necessary to warn him to do something about it. So all these things uh, add up to the fact that ultimately um, it's very, very possible that the, uh, unless there is some secret we weaponry that uh, uh, Russia has developed that we're not aware of that will suddenly appear on the scene, and uh, then of course uh, this might change everything. But if nothing in this field uh, really will surprise us, then uh, we, not, we may not need to uh, be concerned about what's going to happen in the next few months in Ukraine. Interesting point. Uh, Yair, I want to turn to you. Amos mentioned earlier President Zelensky, Zelensky's Jewish identity. Um, and he actually spoke uh, to Haaretz uh, three months ago when we had our democracy conference, gave a speech and spoke about it as well. Um, uh, there's also a big Jewish community in Russia still today and in Ukraine, also a sizable Jewish community. What has been the, the impact of this war on the Jewish life in these two countries? Well, I think that we need to remember that this is uh, uh, part of the calculations also of the Israeli government. In, uh, in Russia, you have today at least 200,000 Jews. In Ukraine, also, you have a big uh, community of uh, Jewish people. And, and I think that uh, when Israel is uh, considering how to act, of course, the, this issue is always on the table. And it's uh, an important issue. Um, and so I think that uh, when we look um, at the Jewish community in uh, Russia, we see different reactions from uh, different parts of the, of the community. Uh, we uh, saw that, for example, the chief rabbi of Moscow, Pinchas Goldschmidt, uh, left Russia. Came to and, Tel Aviv, I think. Yeah, and criticized the war, criticized Putin, um, and was very candid in the way he did it. Uh, but still, for example, uh, Chabad, uh, which is, a very, is very strong in Russia, and the uh, chief rabbi of Chabad, uh, Ber Lazar, stayed in Russia didn't really condemn, um, and, it, it, and I think that this is also, uh, uh, when, you, when you look at this uh, situation, it can tell you exactly 
you know, how, how the Jewish community is, again, a, a kind of a, a chip, like a bargain chip within this uh, bigger picture. And of course, the Russian knows it, know it. And uh, it also has to do with the uh, with the Sochnut, uh, Yeah, the complex. Jewish agency. Yeah, the exactly. idea of shutting them down. We, this trial has been ongoing for ongoing almost a year. Ongoing for months now, and I, I suspect that it will go on like that for for a while uh, until the Russians will get to a conclusion how what to do. It depends also, of course, on the, what Israel will do. So yes, the Jewish community is, is is part of this of this of the picture, part of the game. And there is another uh, thing that I wanted to add about about um, the the Russian. Uh, a policy and, it, and its a policy towards Iran. Because we see in the last uh, few months how there is a, a dipping cooperation more and more. Uh, and, and I think this is also something which could or might uh, change the attitude of the Israeli government in its policy towards Russia. Uh, when the Russians are cooperating so closely with Iran, um, you know, there are Iranian uh, pilots in Russia being trained on the Sukhoi 35. Uh, there is a deeper and closer cooperation, and I'm sure that in Israel uh, they are watching very closely what's going on, and it might affect future decisions. So this is an interesting uh, comment on the policy-making level, Ksenia. I want to ask you more on the public opinion level. I remember a few years ago, Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his election campaign, when we used to have one every six months, um, showcasing posters and huge advertisements of himself with Putin shaking hands and uh, celebrating their supposed friendship. Has the events of the, the last year, um, ex including this alliance with Iran, shifted the views of Putin and Russia in the Israeli discourse, in the public opinion over here? Well, uh, yes and no, uh, because, uh, uh, for example, in the poll that was conducted by Mitvim Institute uh, for Foreign uh, Studies, um, we found out a few months ago that Russia is being graded as the second most important country for Israel. After and the United after States. After the United States, very close to the United States and with big, you know, difference from the European Union, from the Arab countries and so on. And when you're thinking about the importance of, for example, trade relations with Russia, I mean, this is a very small, it's a sliver of what we have, I mean, even with Turkey. Yeah. Or, uh, or, or the, other U, countries. the EU is the our EU, biggest even, partner. Yeah. I'm not even describing this because yeah. it's like tenfold. Uh, but still, in the public opinion, Russia is still a very it's a mighty country. It's a country that we don't want to cross. Uh, Putin is still uh, the leader that some believe that he might prevail and, you know, look at what he's doing to Ukrainians, look at all of the damage, he is wiping their cities. Uh, we should stay out of his way. This is the, this is the, uh, basically the outcome of this. Now, uh, if I'm looking at uh, Netanyahu, the man who was taking pride at his very personal good relations, uh, then again, you know, I'm looking at his memoir, Bibi, that was published already into the war. Uh, and and just a few months ago. Yeah. Just a few months ago, and it had a very specific description of his uh, talks with Putin, some praise to Putin as a very uh, uh, wise and strong leader and so on. Any this criticism? is already a few, not a, any, no criticism. Not a single <laughs> word of I did no. not read the book, so no. I, I have to I trust read you or, uh, <laughs> I, I read specifically, it's a 600 uh, yes. pages uh, <laughs> a volume, so you know, I read specifically the chapter where he described Putin because it was interesting. Uh, and you see there a real admiration. I mean, you know, uh, again, we are different countries. Obviously, we have different regimes, different methods. But I cannot not to make this comparison uh, of maybe a sense of detachment, you know, and uh, we are looking at their leader who has been there for over 20 years. Of course, it's not the same case here because Netanyahu went and, uh, and came, but no, he was they, there. they also had Medvedev, but <laughs> yes. it's different. But, but, you know, there is this sense of detachment from the rest of the world and what's going on in the country, the uh, underestimation of what are the Ukrainians, what is their might. Uh, when, they, when Putin is talking about the uh, uh, demonstrators, the protesters, those who don't agree with his policy, they're anarchists. You said they, Putin, I think you meant Netanyahu this time. And oh. I think I met Putin. Aha, uh -huh, yes, okay, I, I like, I, I understand now. I met Putin, but, you know, the comparison is inevitable because yeah. here you have the leader it's of the, the same democratic language. country yeah. who uses exactly the same language. And still believes, perhaps truly, that the people who are, uh, you know, uh, he called them the uh, anti-vaxxers, yes. you know, it's still this slight min minority that do not agree. In Russia, they are indeed a minority, but not here. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there are some, some, some lines there. In the public opinion, I think that 
again, you know, in Israel, the majority of Russian speakers, if you ask me, they came from Ukraine, actually, or from Belarus, or from Moldova, but not from Russia itself. And even for those who came from Russia, I mean, I was born in Russia, but I came 32 years ago. And uh, if anything, you know, this is an example of how not to do things, how not to do policy. Uh, people do not want to be associated with any of this. But again, you know, they are a minority. They are a minority, and I think for the rest of the Israelis, it's still very much, you know, something that's very frightening. Uh, one of the top Israeli channels, the most watched, uh, viewed one, has a daily forecast for newspaper, for, for, for weather, and you have the Russia in the first place. It's first Moscow, and then New York, and then other cities. So, I mean, it's, it's small, telling. Small but interesting Small but example. telling about, you know, how is, you know, it's how? being viewed, this, this Russian giant, the Russian bear. Interesting stuff to think about. I, I, if I'm, I, I want to turn to you in a second with a nuclear question, but the most before that, I, I want to connect to Ksenia's words. Um, it seems to me that the Biden administration has been very, very patient with the Israeli approach so far on the Ukraine war. I, I at certain points, expected Washington to be much tougher, uh, seeing such a close ally basically you know, <coughs> not join the rest of the democratic world in condemning Putin and supporting Ukraine. It's hard to explain why this exactly happened. I think in the beginning, uh, what you're referring to is uh, Bennett's mission. Uh, the diplomatic attempt as a sort yeah. of a mediator between Zelensky and Putin, which looked very strange from this direction, but yet nothing was said out of the White House or the State Department at that time. No, nothing disparaging um, regarding Bennett. When it was Bennett and Lapid, maybe the general line of thinking um, in the White House was okay, these are our friends, our allies, uh, we expect more of them, but right now let's uh, leave things as they are. Because now, we don't want to, to hurt a government okay, that is not led by Netanyahu. And the opposite explanation regarding Netanyahu. There are so many other things the uh, administration <laughs> has to fight over with Netanyahu, yeah. whether it's uh, his, uh, uh, his legal plans or the situation in the West Bank or uh, members uh, like Smotrich and Bengvir, members of his inner cabinet, uh, trying to build more settlements in the territories, maybe it's not the top priority. But I think there's still some sense in Washington. I visited the last time I was there was December. And there was some sense of frustration with Israel. In spite of everything else, yeah, you, you would expect more from us. The, the sentiment I came back with then from Washington was, uh, look, you also need to be on the right side of history. Mm. And I wrote a piece, I'm not sure, maybe about the month before I went to Washington, and that somehow it became the front page uh, story for Aritz on, on a Friday, which said exactly the same thing. The headline said, sometimes you need to be on the right side of history. And then Bennett, who retired by then, a few days later wrote a piece for Yediot uh, Achronot, and he said, the people who talk about the right side of history know nothing about history. So that was Bennett's response. <laughs> I, I beg to differ. I still think that uh, in, it, there's a moral point of view here, and I think that we've been wasting too much time regarding this. I'm not saying let's send them uh, Israeli F-35 pilots right now. We shouldn't be bombing Moscow. But I think we should probably take a, 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 a more courageous stand about this issue. Okay. If I'm in the early days of the war, you wrote a fascinating article for us on Haaretz.com about the nuclear aspect, uh, because the fears were very high at the time. Um, where do you see this risk standing today of Putin going all the way? I don't think Putin will go all the way. Uh, as you probably know, we all know uh, he took one more step concerning the only remaining uh, agreement on the, the nuclear aspect. Uh, and said, uh, more or less uh, intimated, that he might not renew it when the time comes. But he left the option on the table. He likes to play with this uh, uh, aspect, with this warning. <clears throat> but I really don't think that he uh, is going to entertain this. But I'd like to say two other things. First of all, let's not forget that there is a very large Muslim community in Russia. And uh, uh, I know that he has said on, on occasion, and I will not uh, vo uh, quote directly from meetings I've had with him, but I, this is something... Uh, you were I leading the Mossad when he became president of Russia at the time? No, he was president of Russia when I was head of the Mossad, and I saw him as president, <laughs> as, as, as head of the Mossad. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were going to have a meeting of 20 minutes, and it lasted almost two hours. And in the end, we were like two intelligence officers uh, exchanging views. But that was not the point. Well, there's a large Muslim presence in Russia. The biggest mosque in Europe is, was built in Russia by Putin. 
And when he inaugurated it, the uh, guest of honor was Mr. Erdogan. And uh, in Moscow itself, there's a very large uh, Muslim presence. And uh, I've heard Russians say that there is a danger, they called it, they used the word danger, that in the years to come, because of the uh, difference in the uh, birth rate amongst Muslims and uh, uh, indigenous Russians, it might well be that uh, a situation will arise in which the majority of the population in Moscow will be Muslim. But I've heard it said, not directly but indirectly, that this is something that Russia will not allow to happen uh, without telling how they will do that and how they will accomplish it. But coming again back to the uh, nuclear uh, aspect, um, I think that um, Putin realizes that, uh, and he's uh, uh, responsible enough to realize that once he enters uh, a, an operational uh, mode on the uh, nuclear uh, issue, there will be uh, a, an element of early warning here. If there's something which is watched so very closely, to do something secretly to prepare a nuclear uh, attack, uh, this is something which uh, needs a lot of uh, expertise, and it may not necessarily succeed in hiding the intention. So I do not think that this is going to happen. I don't think we should uh, look at these things and we should attach it uh, so much importance and such a degree of importance. One, like, one, like, one last thing I want to say. Yes, there is a Chabad uh, presence in Moscow. And the rabbi of Zelensky is a Chabad rabbi. His name is rabbi, uh, uh, a rabbi in uh, Dnipro. And uh, he is a very fine man. Uh, we know him very well. I know him very well because uh, I have a, uh, a small little uh, uh, society which deals with uh, immigration into Israel. And uh, I think that uh, he has a lot of influence over Zelensky. And uh, if somebody really wants to get and to influence Zelensky, the ways to talk to him. So, so, uh, so maybe instead of Prime Minister Bennett, what we needed was Chabad to do the mediation between Putin and Zelensky, is what you're saying. Uh, I think, well, you know, uh, the, the, the rabbi himself is no longer with us. Uh, so we don't have a, uh, a, a successor. Uh, I don't think Chabad can do this. They've not done this in the past, by the way. But they are present everywhere, as you know. And that is uh, something which we uh, should uh, take into account. Definitely. Yair, I, I want to ask you uh, about the issue of immigration from these countries. If I mentioned the immigration from Russia, from Ukraine, it's been really on the rise. Uh, and I think actually more Jews came from Russia since the war began to Israel than from Ukraine. Yeah, I think that uh, overall in the last year, uh, more than 600,000 people left Russia. Um, and within this number, you have uh, also, of course, uh, Jewish people who uh, immigrated. Uh, many of them are from the Russian elite or the, the, the cultural elite. A lot of them are uh, skilled uh, IT people. And of course, they are part of the population and they didn't want to stay in Russia. And they were afraid that uh, you know, uh, the reality is going to be so bad, there is no point to staying. It, it's also, it, and it's also, I think, uh, was uh, a kind of uh, a way to show, uh, to reject the war. And we, to say that we, we do not agree with what uh, the regime uh, then is doing in Ukraine. And they, and they left. But of course, uh, many of them stayed as well, because there are many. Mm -hmm. And specifically on, on the issue of Israel and the immigration, I think there's also been an, an issue with sanctions, that there's some concern that maybe Israel will become a haven for people who are trying to avoid the EU sanctions on them. Yeah, for example, because we all, uh, we all know about uh, uh, Russian oligarchs who are uh, staying in Israel and they have like kind of, a safe, kind of a safe haven in Israel, financially as well. And I think this is also uh, part of the, of the reality. I can add on the sanctions. Uh, I think that uh, the fears that 
also, you know, some people in Israel share them, the Americans, uh, they did not fulfill in this regard for Israel to become a safe haven in this uh, sense. Because uh, uh, although we do not have sanctions, which I think uh, this is uh, horrible, even if there was no uh, mechanism for sanctions in the Knesset before, they had one year to mm -hmm. <laughs> legislate, and we know that they, when they want to legislate something very quickly, they can actually do it, and they're doing it right now with the legal reform. So uh, if they wanted to, to you know, legislate, they could. But the financial system of Israel is actually in full compliance with the American sanctions and with the EU sanctions. And they are, uh, I would say, religiously comply, you know, with everything. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's even the U.S. that comes and says, listen, you are doing things that are unnecessary. <laughs> for example, the payments for the uh, elder people from Russia who receive their pensions, it's, it's nothing. But for them, it's something. It's 40, 50, 100 dollars. And this money is being stalled because it's, it's very difficult to transfer it from the Russian banking system to the Israeli one. So this is on one hand. On the other hand, culturally, I can tell you that, yes, the Russian sanctioned artists, ballets, are coming to Israel to make their buck because they are unable anymore to go to Europe to perform there. Here they are welcomed. You have uh, still the audience, also the native-born Israelis, also the, those who came from Russia and, uh, and even Ukraine, uh, that attend the concerts and then go to see the artists. Um, and uh, there is cultural influence that is also going, you know, it's very important. Uh, but the um, it, Russian propaganda TV channels that were banned, uh, for example, in the Latvian republics, in the UA, in the UK, in other countries as well. Here you have it's you know it's available on every provider, uh, and the people who do not know better or they have language difficulties, so on, they are basically trapped. Uh, they only you know have the thing that in Russian that they have uh, access to. It's these propaganda channels, and if you would listen only to them for a couple of weeks, then you would also think that you know there are <laughs> Nazis in Ukraine uh, and the Illuminati that are running the world, uh, and uh, George George Soros that is funding the uh, Zelensky and his army personally. Sounds to me like it's better to get your information on haaretz.com than Much these channels. Uh, Amos, the last question I want to turn to you and. Really, it's been such a fascinating conversation with everyone here at the table. Um, I do want to ask you one last question that has to do with Iran. Um, is it emerging emboldened from its involvement in the war with Ukraine? Uh, is Israel concerned about what the Iranians are doing there when it looks also at our homeland security? Look, Iran has made a choice. Uh, I think that in a way, uh, the Israeli media and perhaps some Israeli analysts as well have missed um, the, the importance of this move, the, this emerging alliance between Russia and Iran. This is extremely significant. It's not about, only about the Iranians supplying uh, UAVs uh, to Russia. Uh, Yair has mentioned that, uh, joint uh, exercises, um, training and so on, perhaps weapons from Russia to Iran. Uh, in the future. And you have to remember, in, at the JCPOA in 2015, it was Russia that was supposed to take care of the enriched uranium <laughs> uh, being pulled out of uh, Iran. So how can you count on Russia as a, some positive force regarding future agreements uh, with Iran? This is, this is important. On the other hand, you may say that it backfired um, uh, regarding uh, Iran's relationship with the West, because because of this, and because of the brutal way in which the regime treated the hijab protests, and because of their unwillingness to go back to the negotiation table uh, regarding the, the nuclear deal, uh, the Biden administration is actually taking a tougher stance against Iran and has less to argue about with Netanyahu when it comes to the, the future uh, policy uh, towards Iran. So a blessing and a curse at the same time, you can As say. As usual. Yeah. Amos Arel, Efraim Alevi, Ksenia Svetlova, and Yair Novot, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation, and thank you viewers for joining us. And we're joined now by member of Knesset Ahmed Tibi from the Hadash Tal party. Uh, hello, member of Knesset Tibi, thank you for joining the Haaretz UCLA conference. Um, are we on the verge of a third intifada in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem? The situation is very tense. There is a security deterioration, and the composition of the Israeli uh, government, uh, especially when we are talking about two sensitive posts, uh, Etamar Ben Gvir leading the internal security, 
ministry and Smotrich being uh, second uh, uh, security minister uh, are uh, good reasons for this deterioration. I think uh, they are willing to have confrontation and uh, they think they can benefit politically uh, from third intifada. And what about on the Palestinian side? Where, uh, where the do you Palestinians... see that, what's the dynamic right now with the Palestinian Authority? Because we are hearing more and more warnings that the PA is losing control over parts of the West Bank that uh, basically uh, today, uh, you know, it is the only authority apart from the Israeli military. The Palestinian Authority uh, is being weakened by uh, the continuous incursions and attacks by the occupation to the Palestinian cities of Jenin, Nablus, Jericho, uh, with the killing of uh, uh, more and more Palestinian and Palestinian activists. And uh, uh, that's why there are Palestinians who are reacting to these attacks by the Israeli occupation. For example, in Neve Yaakov, in Ramot, in uh, Hawara, every uh, uh, but, but, one of these uh, 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 was a reaction to incursion to Nablus or to Jenin. And it was obvious that there, this will be the direction. To say the truth, that these attacks uh, 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 to Palestinian cities uh, started in the last government when uh, Benjamin Gantz was security or defense minister. Uh, and this government escalated these attacks and the number of Palestinian casualties. But you know, the, on the Israeli side, the argument is that these incursions into Palestinian cities are in order to stop attacks like the one we saw in Hawara uh, with the two uh, Israeli young men who were shot to death or what we saw outside Jericho. So we are entering here a dynamic where each side blames the other one. And do you see any way to calm down the situation? There was a, a, a summit in Aqaba that the Americans uh, summoned and there were announcements of progress, and then we saw the terror attack in Hawara and the settler attack uh, on the village, and the next day another terror attack, and it looks like it's not going anywhere, what happened in Aqaba. It seems that in the States and Israel, maybe in the international community, uh, there are more and more uh, concern or intervene if there are Israeli casualties. I think we should stop this bloodshed of both Israelis and Palestinians, even there is no symmetry between occupation and those under occupation. But yes, it is possible to stop this bloodshed. It should be stopped, but it cannot be stopped when they are uh, leaders uh, who are insisting to escalate the situation and to have friction and confrontation. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, when he brought uh, Ben-Gvir uh, to this cabinet, he knew what will be the result. Uh, the declaration of Ben-Gvir is absolute incitement. He is inside, these are incitements of the Palestinian community. Palestinian youth are hearing, listening, and reacting to this, uh, to these statements of uh, Ben Gvir or Smotrich. Uh, when there is a minister saying uh, or uh, uh, tweeting that he is supporting uh, burning up uh, Hawara or uh, la, uh, to destroy Hawara. These are 
unprecedented uh, uh, statements and Palestinians listen and react. The international community uh, is dealing with the double standard. Uh, I think that if a Palestinian minister will say that we should uh, destroy or uh, uh, destroy Tel Aviv, uh, the reaction will be different. There is no one minister uh, in the Palestinian cabinet who said or will say so, but there are ministers in the Israeli cabinet who are saying uh, these uh, uh, words and encouraging those settlers as their representative in the government. These settlers in Hawara uh, gain support from being represented, represented by Ben Gvir and Smotrich in this cabinet. To say the truth, in the past there was attacks, many attacks by, by those settlers against Palestinians. They even killed Palestinians by uh, uh, this uh, Helios. Uh, but the picture of Hawara burned is historically is, is I, bad. I, I, I agree with you that it was a, really a horrendous uh, night uh, in Hawara and that the actions of the, the violent people who did it are reprehensible. Uh, I think you will hear, though, politically at least, from this Israeli government, that they will say, we tried this summit in Aqaba and we tried to reach an agreement, but a terror attack like the one that happened in Hewara, and it, of course, in no way justifies not the violence and not the reaction by Smotrich and Ben Gvir, is basically a, 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 an event that would kill any kind of momentum. And do you think, after what happened in the last few days, there is any way to de-escalate, uh, maybe with involvement with some of the regional you, countries, you, or you are, we, before, are we, are we just days, heading toward more and more bloodshed? Before 10 days, there was understanding in the Security Council. Yeah, a statement, a resolution. And it's a statement instead of a resolution. But after one day, there was incursion to Nablus and 12 Palestinians were killed. One of them is a youth of 16 years old, and the second is 61. Uh, Palestinians are counting another beginning, like, uh, and the Israelis is talking about one reaction, one attack, and saying that the Israeli attacks are legitimate but the Palestinian reaction is not. That's the tragedy of this conflict. But if That's you know, why th there's Israel a should stop uh, these incursions and as a title, Israel and Israelis, all go government, this government and the change government led by Naftali Bennett and Lapid did not try even to put an end to occupation. The last government stopped any dialogue with President Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, and they uh, were proud that they are not talking with but, but, Palestinian but the, leadership. But, but Defense Minister Gantz did meet with President Abbas more than once. I think they met once in Ramallah and once in his home, Benny Gantz's home in Israel. So it's not like there was... Today, I don't see the defense minister from this government, from Likud, meeting Mahmoud Abbas, President Abbas, like Benny Gantz met him. So I'm not sure it is completely comparable. I think that comparable. both meetings, Aqaba and that, and that meeting, was not uh, so fruitful. We need real and tough decisions more by the occupation force. Along, if we are not talking about killings, there are another oppression procedures, like settlements, like 
road blocks like a deportation of Palestinians from Masafir Yatta in Hebron, in Al Khalil, or Sheikh uh, Jarrah, or uh, strangulation of Palestinians in East Jerusalem. That's this is occupation. You, you know, we are not talking about some new attacks here and there. It's a continuous oppression of the Palestinians by the occupation and putting an end to occupation as a choice is not on the table. Never was in the table. Well, I, I, I think it's certainly not going to be on the table for this government, but you hear... Definitely, Prime yes. This is a fascist government. But you hear Prime Minister... By definition. Netanyahu, you hear Prime Minister Netanyahu these days saying that he can reach peace with Saudi Arabia and by doing that, bypass the Palestinian problem and solve the Israeli-Arab conflict without reaching any kind of agreement with the Palestinians. Um, and you know, this with, is, of with, course, built on the model of the Abraham Accords. agreements with Arab countries with no borders with Israel, that will do nothing with the real conflict, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, if he has economical agreements with other Arab states, so what? He no, but, is but, by but, putting, but, he but, is but, but bypassing the Palestinian track and uh, not solving the problem. Maybe by this way he is he thinks that he weaken weakening the Palestinian cause. Maybe yes. And it's an issue of the Arab world. This is not the right direction. This is not the right way. The right way is to solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and then the whole Arab and Muslim countries, uh, according to the Arab initiative, will uh, uh, sign a treaty with, with Israel. But Israel, at no time, never accepted the Arab initiative. And you think that this is still the reality today, more than two years after the Abraham Accords? Because they were not only economic agreements. We saw, as a result of them, diplomatic relations, visits by Israelis to the Gulf countries, including many Arab citizens of Israel. There is a real change on the ground. It's not just economic. But the conflict, Israel-Palestinian conflict, sure. and the bloodshed sure. is continuing. That's true. It did not solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but maybe it opened but, but another no window to something else. Definitely no. And when you look today at the situation, one of the main arguments that the Israeli side has been making is that it's very difficult to work in a reality where you have Hamas controlling Gaza, Palestinian Authority in some parts of the West Bank, and it, basically, if you move in one track, it does not necessarily help you solve the other one. When there was a Palestinian unity between Fatah and Hamas, the Israeli government said, and Benjamin Netanyahu, we will not talk with them because there is Hamas in this unity, in this government. When there, there is a split between Fatah and Hamas, Netanyahu says, oh, they are weak. There is a split. They do not represent Palestinians. These are tricks in order not to go forward towards the uh, solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. How do you look at the Biden administration's approach to this issue so far? The, the government in Israel has been in power for 60 days, but the Biden administration is uh, two years now dealing with this issue. We don't feel them. We, they can do more and more and more. It seems that they are trying to keep away from this conflict. Well, they did have the meeting in Jordan, uh, but you're not impressed. So by what? It. So what? The American administration can do more. Can do like, more. Like what? The first step is to use the veto in the Security Council against the settlement activity of Israel. You say not to veto, basically. They are doing their utmost in order 
not to abstain, not to use the veto, not to use the veto. They are using veto and they are doing utmost not to abstain even about settlements that they are saying more and more that they are against it. When Netanyahu and the Israeli government look and see that the American administration is supporting Israel in the Security Council on the issue of the settlements, they continue their settlements activity. Um, yeah, and I, and I think it's definitely going to be a dilemma for this administration after what they tried to do in this intervention in Jordan had failed. Um, I do want to ask you, when you look at this government today, uh, it's two months, there was criticism at the time toward your party for supporting the dissolution of the Knesset under the previous government. Basically, in order to dissolve the Knesset, um, the, the, the opposition at the time led by Netanyahu was counting on the votes of the joint list as well. And when you look at the result of the government that we have today, do you have any regrets about it in retrospect? First of all, we were opposition. It's, you know, <laughs> it's ridiculous that the coalition is accusing an opposition party because they failed. Second, uh, the dissolving of the Knesset was supported not by 6159, uh, as somebody is trying to say. Yeah, at the, at the, at the end, Ninety-two zero. Yeah. 920. Why? Because Yemina, the party of Naftali Bennett, broke down. And Edith Silman, head of the coalition, chairman of the coalition, moved to the Likud. She resigned. Now she's, a, now, now she's and a minister in the government. Uri Orbach also did the same. Not Ahmad Tibi and Ayman Audi. We were in the coalition and we moved to the opposition. We were in the opposition then and we were now and we are now in the opposition. To say the truth, they never propose us not a coalition, not even support from outside. When Edith Silman resigned, both Hendel and uh, some leaders of Yesh Atid say, we will not rely on terrorists. They call us Mihablim. Not uh, not, not the supporters of terrorism, terrorism, but like Netanyahu said, they called us mehablim terrorists. Okay, they even did not ask us. I don't know if we will asking if we were asking them to join. They will say they asked to join, and we say no, no to these terrorists. But. I think we supported, we voted yes with them in more than 30, 40% of their proposals in the Knesset. And still that government killed more Palestinians of my people in the West Bank than any other government in 18 years ago. And yes, they I, are proud of that. More than all the Netanyahu governments. Yes, um, the and last... nobody should ask me to support the government killing my people. Okay. Uh, Member of TV, the last question I want to ask you, we spoke a lot about the Israeli political scene. What happens in the Palestinian political arena the day after Mahmoud Abbas? He is not a young man. Nobody knows. No. <laughs> I think nobody knows. Uh, but, you know, the same question was when Yasser Arafat uh, was in power. They said, who will be next? What will be the result? What will be the situation? I hope things will go smooth. And at the end, election will be the solution, the democratic solution for everything. And an election that will include Hamas? 
the Palestinian people should decide uh, who, who to vote, all factions. Okay, well, it will be an interesting moment when we get there. A member of Knesset TV, thank you for joining us at the conference. Thank you, today. Amir. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to our panel on Israel and the New Middle East. I'm Alison Kaplan Sommer, a journalist at Haaretz and the host of the Haaretz Weekly podcast. I'm really honored to welcome such a distinguished panel who represents such a wealth of experience and expertise. Uh, let me briefly introduce them to you. First, my colleague here, Noah Landau, Haaretz Deputy uh, Editor-in-Chief. Uh, Greg Karlstrom, the Middle East correspondent for The Economist, speaking to us from Dubai. And Hussein Ibish, the senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, DC. Welcome again it's to all pleasure. of you. Thank you. So let's get right to it, since there's a lot of Middle East to cover, old and new. Um, let's start our tour with Iran. Um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is back. And so is a return to what was a regular feature in the news in his previous stint in office. Hints, if not outright threats, of a major military action by Israel against Iran's nuclear facilities. What seems like a not-so-accidental leak in the Israeli media this week has Netanyahu holding five meetings with his defense and intelligence chiefs to discuss this possible attack. It comes against the background of progress uh, in the Iranian military nuclear program with weapons-grade enrichment that reaches the level to which, in the past, Netanyahu said was Israel's red line. Um, and there has been action in the region. We had a drone strike on January 28th, which had Iran promising uh, retaliation uh, against the damage to its military facilities. Um, Greg, have things changed to the point that this is a real possibility? Are we talking about saber rattling with no real results? And does the fact that the American-Iranian uh, nuclear deal, the JCPOA, is basically dead in the water for the meantime, do you think that's making Israel emboldened enough to really contemplate such action? And if so, what's the U.S. take on it? I'm not sure how much Netanyahu would be emboldened by the JCPOA being dead in the water. I think uh, going back to his previous stint in office, he made it his mission uh, to try and sabotage this deal, to try and undermine this deal at every turn. I don't think he was ever particularly constrained by it. Uh, but I do think a lot has changed. I mean, we've heard these reports of Iran uh, enriching up to 84% purity, enriching uranium up to 84% purity. Um, we have progress we heard from Bill Burns, the American CIA director a couple of days ago, talking about also the progress that Iran has made on its missile program, saying the Americans still don't think that uh, the Supreme Leader has made a decision to restart what he called the weaponization program, uh, which would refer to not just enriching uranium, but having the capacity to, to fashion that into a warhead and then deliver that to a target, but it has made progress on sort of all of the other elements that it would need to in order to have a, a functioning military nuclear program. So I think the open question now vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and it's a question that people ask here in the Gulf and elsewhere around the region is, you know, for a long time, the assessment of Netanyahu was that he would rattle the saber, but when it came down to it, he wouldn't take that final step. He wouldn't actually order military action. He had a reputation despite the saber rattling for being somewhat cautious in actions. Is it still the same Netanyahu? Has he changed uh, during his time in the political wilderness? Has his view of the Iranian nuclear issue and of the use of military force changed? And uh, it's something that, that people are wondering in the Gulf, honestly, and, and don't have an answer to. Hussein, what do you see in the region um, uh, when they're contemplating the idea of a possible uh, Israeli attack? Uh, well, I think it's, it's something that makes uh, Gulf Arab countries very nervous. Uh, and I think there's the question of would Israel act alone or in concert with the United States? Now, the United States is going to get blamed anyway. And it's likely to be dragged into some kind of a confrontation. But it depends also on the Iranian response. I mean, there are lots of different scenarios. A military strike could be a limited one aimed at a specific facility that would allow Iran to uh, not necessarily ignore it, but to uh, it launch a reprisal short of an all-out war. Or it could be a major attack designed to truly push Iran back several years. 
away from this 90% enrichment uh, target, which is weapons grade. And as Greg said, they've reached 84%. Um, so it really, a lot of, uh, you know, the scenario depends a lot on the scope of Israel's attack, if there is one, and I do think it's possible. Uh, and then what would the Iranian response be? Because it might be more uh, clever on the Iranian part to have a very limited response and then go back to the sprint or use that as an excuse to sprint towards weaponization, uh, whether, you know, in spite of uh, military attacks. And I think all of that is entirely possible. So this is now an incredibly murky area, and it causes the Arab countries in the Gulf region enormous amount of anxiety because they would be front and center, particularly the UAE, a country with a lot of skin in the game and no strategic depth whatsoever. Uh, they, w I think, would feel extremely exposed in such a scenario. When you say limited response or limited uh, reprisal uh, by Iran, what are you thinking about? Um, but it could be something that would take place in, in Iraq or in Syria. It could be something uh, done by Hezbollah rather than Iran itself or by a PMF group in, uh, based in uh, Iraq. It might be aimed not at Israel or the United States, but at Gulf Arab countries. And uh, again, as I say, it could be the UAE. You could see something, uh, some kind of reprisal from Iran involving um, uh, you know, deniability, plausible deniability, right? And limited to the point that it would send the message that they know they have to respond, but they don't want a, a wider war. It might be in their interest to, to, to kind of avoid a bigger conflict and instead sprint towards weaponization if they can. And there's a great deal of activity going on apparently deep underground and as far as I know, Israel has not received the bunker busters that would be necessary uh, to attack such facilities from the United States. And that could be a major warning signal to Tehran. If Tehran starts moving too fast in the direction of weaponization, and we saw the United States providing those conventional bunker buster bombs to Israel, uh, I think that could be a very strong signal to Iran that, you know, hold on, you know, we're, we're, we're serious about a military option. Noah, uh, as our close observer of the Israeli political scene and the behavior of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and, uh, and the people around him, in the past when we've come close and there have been serious rumors of uh, contemplating an attack on Iran, there have been, you know, in a lot of um, uh, telling the story afterwards, tales of members of the cabinet of the senior defense establishment really standing up and blocking um, Netanyahu's desire to attack. Does the radical change in the makeup of the Israeli government, of the ministers around Netanyahu, um, which includes some serious uh, tensions uh, in the defense establishment at the moment, does that affect the calculus of whether or not an attack uh, would take place? Well, on one hand, it's true that we now have the most religious, the most extreme far-right government that we ever had in Israel's history. But also, I think we should bear in mind that that's, most of them usually express that towards the Palestinian issue. When it comes to Iran, the truth is that in Israel, there's actually not a lot of opposition. Uh, the mainstream politics are mostly, you know, the, the, there aren't a lot of discussions uh, that really oppose Netanyahu. In terms of an attack, you know, we're not, as um, um, uh, was said before me, Israel is not alone. There's the U.S. The U.S. is crucial for this. I don't really think that Israel would attack, you know, um, um, if the U.S. is, is absolutely against it. And, uh, as uh, uh, you know, it was also said that uh, we need some equipment for that. So of course, you know, we need the U.S. The U.S., you know, we know the Biden administration and we know how they feel about Iran. So I don't think, you know, it's such a, it's not that different, I think, than, you know, the, there are some mechanism that, that could still put Netanyahu, you know, in balance uh, in that scenario. But um, I also think that, you know, Iran also changed and we have to look at the U.S. basically to see, 
if we have, you know, that's where we'll see the signs. I don't think that the Israeli ministers, extreme as they are, uh, would be the ones uh, to move this forward or stop this. Um, I, don't, I don't think they are, you know, the, um, the, the, the center players in this, in this case. Okay. Um, so uh, moving on uh, to what you said is the central concern of many of these extreme ministers, the, uh, the Palestinian uh, issue. No one will call it an intifada, um, but we are certainly in the middle of a terror wave in uh, Jerusalem and in the West Bank. Um, it's happening with this unprecedented far-right Israeli government that's ideologically committed to settlement expansion, rejects a two-state solution, and wants more than the status quo, wants to move ahead with incorporating um, the West Bank uh, into the state of Israel um, uh, territorially. Uh, we record this panel following a day of duality. On Sunday, yesterday, the day before we're recording, uh, there was a summit hosted by Jordan, attended by Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, um, attempting to stop the rising violence before the tense uh, month of Ramadan. It ended with a declaration saying that the parties would de-escalate tensions, and um, there was a disagreement on what had been agreed regarding uh, the settlement issue. But on the very same day, even as the summit was taking place, we had a terror attack that killed two young men. And in response, mobs of settlers burned houses, cars, shops, and farms in a rampage in the Huara village. And in the wake of that attack, we had high-ranking members of the coalition, ministers, finance minister Betsalel Smotrich, national security minister Itamar Ben-Gvir, dismissing the summit in the wake of the terror attack. Ben-Gvir even said, what happens in Jordan stays in Jordan. Greg, what do we make of this duality, if you will, the new Middle East versus the old Middle East? Um, uh, which Middle East, which voices, the ones coming out of something like the summit or these cabinet ministers? Uh, there was also a tweet from Netanyahu who pretty much dismissed what happened in Jordan. Who does the world listen to and how do they respond? That's exactly the question right now is, is first, where this is going in the West Bank. You look back to the first Intifada, and, and that was sort of a grassroots uh, civil society-led movement. You look at the second Intifada, that was a, uh, a movement directed or, or an action directed by Palestinian factions. Neither of those two things really exist at this point. Civil society uh, has been sort of systematically undermined in, in the Palestinian territories for years. And of course, the political factions don't really have much in the way of the pop, uh, popularity. The PA certainly does not have much in the way of popularity or legitimacy. And so I don't know if there's ever going to be a sort of starting gun calling this an intifada, but uh, I would say this wave or this whatever we're going to call it is likely to continue. And that is going to dictate, uh, I think, the way this is seen by the world and the way the world reacts to this. I mean, yes, some nice things were said uh, or reportedly said at this summit in Jordan, and, and nice things have been said for years. But uh, I think for, for Palestinians, certainly listening to this, uh, nice things have been said for years, and they don't amount to much on the ground. And uh, it's going to be what happens on the ground. It's going to be what happens on the street that, that sort of dictates how this is perceived rather than what is said by a handful of ministers around a table at a meeting. Hussein, what do you uh, say about the duality of the more peaceful or attempt to make peace voices coming out of a place like the summit and the, uh, the much more vociferous voices coming out of senior members of the, uh, of the Israeli cabinet? And in general, do you foresee a escalation in what's happening now? Yeah, I think Greg's right. I do foresee an escalation. Uh, I don't see anything that de-escalates the situation at all. Um, I mean, look, ever since uh, 22 years ago, the Camp David summit in uh, the summer of 2000 failed. The most likely scenario in the long run was that Israel would try to impose by force what it couldn't get the Palestinians to agree to at the bargaining table, that is new borders that suit Israel's agenda, that in other words, where large chunks of the West Bank plus uh, East Jerusalem are 
formally incorporated into the Israeli state, and the rest of the occupied Palestinian territories are sort of cast off. And I think despite so many people not wanting to see that happen, uh, we've been moving steadily in that direction almost at every stage ever since. And I think we're getting awfully close to the point where the Israeli government and even Israeli society could countenance uh, a big annexation and even expulsion done in the middle of, of a major uh, outbreak of violence. And it would be framed as a painful necessity, right? We just got to protect these settlers. They're Israeli citizens. We have to protect them. And we can't have this go on anymore. Therefore, we have to annex and even also expel Palestinians from areas, especially places like Hebron and whatnot, which will not be left. Uh, in a castaway area. Now, I, I don't know how this happens or when it happens, et cetera, but we're getting closer and closer to the day when some form of real annexation and probably some expulsions take place. And I'll, I'll point out that Smotrich has just been given uh, authority over the uh, settlements and Isra Israeli, Jewish Israelis living in the occupied West Bank. And that really is sort of the Jerusalemization of most of the settlements. And, and it's a real huge step towards de facto annexation, as well as de jure annexation of parts of the occupied territories. And, and that just is another uh, phase of escalation in a, in a conflict. It won't end it. To the contrary, it'll make it worse. Noah, Israel is riven, focused completely on the struggle over these judicial um, reforms or judicial revolution um, that would transform uh, the nature of the Israeli government with a huge, huge, huge protest movement um, uh, that Netanyahu is facing. Um, is there a wag the dog factor here? Uh, is there any kind of interest in you know, putting the focus on security, on terror, on a place where Israelis stand together um, that works to uh, Netanyahu's advantage? Or would the, you know, greater uh, feeling of threat and that this government is not keeping us safe from terror uh, deteriorate um, his position with the Israeli public more? Well, first of all, I really hope not. I really hope that no one is that cynical, you know, to use uh, uh, violence and, and, and blood, you know, to just deter the, the conversation. But I also think that it's pretty clear that this judicial coup, basically, is, you know, is also meant to serve what's happening in the West Bank. You can't really separate the two of them. You know, there are some yeah. people um, in Israel that claim that they are protesting against what they see as an attack on democracy or, the, or democratic liberal values, but they don't see how it's connected to the occupation. But of course it is, and we saw it. We saw it in Hawara last night that, uh, you know, there's parts of this government. Of course Netanyahu might want this judicial so-called reform because he has his own private issues with the law. But also he has parts of this government, as we said, very extreme, very religious, far right, even Kahanist, that actually, um, you know, they want to annex. That, that's actually you know, in the coalition agreements mm -hmm. that the whole of the yeah. Israel land belongs to the Jews and they, of course, they want to annex the territory. Of course, de facto, they already do, but the question is more the U.S. And um, we see that that's part of the reason they want this legal coup anyways, because they want legal advisors or uh, judges that will basically allow them to uh, go against the international law. So they're not disconnected, the two. Mm -hmm. Um, we could continue for a long time about the Palestinian issue, but we'll move on to the Gulf states, um, where Greg is speaking, us, uh, speaking to us from. Um, I just came back uh, from a trip to Dubai, and from the amount of Hebrew in the streets, the Abraham Accords are alive and well, as far as uh, tourism is concerned, at least in that direction. Um, I'm interested, uh, Greg, in uh, what we've seen so far from your perspective in the Gulf, in Dubai, in the UAE. How have the accords held up during all of this period of political transition uh, in Israel? Um, how are they withstanding the ascension of the far right wing government uh, led by Netanyahu? And um, do you see any clear red line that if this government crosses 
the accords could fall apart, that the countries who signed on to these diplomatic relations with Israel could withdraw from them? I think first, let's um, let's say what, what is and what is not a problem about this government, this Israeli government from the perspective of the Gulf states. Uh, they are not particularly worried about the status of Israeli democracy or the future of Israeli democracy for the simple reason that these are not democracies either. Uh, I haven't met anyone in the Gulf who is particularly exercised about the separation of powers in Israel or whether the Knesset can override a Supreme Court decision or not. Uh, these are not issues that they worry about. When they look at this government, uh, their concerns are the Abraham Accords were fundamentally signed out of self-interest. And so the concern in the Gulf is, do the Accords still serve their self-interest? They were primarily a security pact uh, signed by countries that have similar security fears. So far, the Netanyahu government has not done anything that, that particularly worries them. But there is this lingering question about Iran. I think this in the UAE, as Hussein said earlier, this is a real concern in the UAE, this feeling that if Israel were to attack Iran, that the UAE might bear the brunt of that retaliation. And so there is a bit of unease about what Netanyahu is going to do with regards to the Iranians. Uh, I would say these were secondarily an economic pact, and, and we've heard nothing for two months, but dire warnings about what these proposed judicial changes are going to mean for the Israeli economy. Uh, if these changes go through and these warnings do come to pass and, and the Israeli economy takes a serious hit, that will somewhat diminish perhaps the utility uh, of the accords in terms of Israeli investment into the Gulf, Israeli tourism going to the Gulf. I don't think that's enough to actually undermine the accords, but that would make them seem less useful. And then there's the question of, uh, again, the, the Palestinians, the, the subject that many people here in the Gulf and many people in the government in Jerusalem would prefer not to talk about. You talk to uh, officials in the Gulf, many of them do not care in private about the Palestinians. You hear things about the Palestinians that would not sound out of place in an ideological right-wing settlement uh, in the West Bank. But uh, even if officials don't care about the Palestinians, many of their constituents still do. And so scenes like we saw yesterday, the, the rampage in Hawara, those are the kinds of things that really give governments here pause because they resonate with the population. If we see more and more uh, scenes like we saw yesterday. Again, do I think they're going to, to cause the accords to fall apart? Not imminently. Even annexation, I think, uh, would not completely shred the agreements. It might cause the UAE to take a symbolic step, put them on pause for a while, downgrade relations with Israel, make some kind of diplomatic show. But uh, I think as long as the underlying security part of the bargain is still intact, uh, I think they will have an interest in, in preserving the agreements. Hussein, I'm interested yeah. in your reaction to uh, to what Greg said, and particularly in regard to annexation, because if we rewind back in history, the Accords came to be basically as a way to stave off the planned annexation uh, steps that Netanyahu wanted to take um, in the yeah. aftermath of the Trump deal of the century. Or at least Netanyahu they wanted to appear so. Trump. Right, exactly. Netanyahu and Trump both got themselves into a pickle over annexation uh, because uh, the peace plan, that so-called peace plan, peace to prosperity business that Jared Kushner released in January of 2000 and then Netanyahu's campaign in the late spring and early summer of 2000, both sort of envisioned annexation. But Netanyahu ran on a platform of actually implementing that annexation. Trump didn't want him to do that. And then once he'd won the election, he didn't want to do it either. So they were in this pickle. In swoops the UAE with a solution. You give us a four-year guarantee of no more and no annexation whatsoever, and we'll salvage the two-state solution, that's their rhetoric, and by doing this and by preventing annexation. But of course, the real purpose is everything Greg was saying, security, economics, and in the case of the UAE, not Bahrain, it's R&D, science and technology, specific kinds of military technology that are common to both Israel and the UAE, which are 
countries with much bigger military footprints than they have strategic depth and that don't have big populations. So they need good imaging, they good, good signals, intel, uh, good advanced radar warning, missile defense, stuff like that. Okay, so it's, it, these are the ideas. And the idea of, of the Abraham Accords in the Gulf really was to, to, to start doing what the rest of the world and the West already does, which is to separate relations with Israel on one hand and uh, you know, objections to the occupation on the other and break them apart and have two parallel tracks going. And the problem for uh, the UAE in particular is that that works until it doesn't. And where it really, these two parallel lines start intersecting in a dangerous way is when there's violence in Jerusalem especially connected with Al-Aqsa, especially connected with the holy sites. But even in a place, place like Sheikh Jarrah, when this stuff happens, it, it becomes much more politically costly for the UAE. And I understand what Greg's saying. You hear a lot of cynicism from Gulf leaders about the Palestinians. They really are talking about the Palestinian national leadership, whether it's the PLO and the PA and or Hamas. I don't think they really have uh, ill will towards the Palestinian people. Indeed, I actually think uh, most people in the Gulf, including most Gulf leaders, if they could reverse what happened in 1948, they would do so. They have a lot of fellow feeling with the ordinary Palestinians. They're just incredibly frustrated with the Palestinian leadership, and I think that's understandable. But it does certainly cause them more anxiety and pain when the violence increases and when it's located in Jerusalem. So just on the point of annexation, its effect would depend on its scope, right? If Israel really annexed 40% of the occupied territories, I think that could be uh, a, a major blow uh, to the uh, viability of the Abraham Accord. If Israel were to annex sort of some of the big settlement blocks, uh, then I think, as Greg said, it could, it could go forward. It really depends, and it depends a lot on the Palestinian reaction and the question of violence, especially in occupied East Jerusalem. Um, Noah, uh, in the personal calculus of Benjamin Netanyahu, how much would the threat of losing this diplomatic achievement, the Abraham Accords, losing the relationships with the Gulf states, could that at all affect or rein in his behavior, his decision making with regard to Iran, with regard to the Palestinians? Uh, in any case, how much do you think he's, he's taking it into account and listening to the voices coming out of the Gulf? Well, I have to agree with Greg. I don't think the, the Gulf states are, you know, that concerned about democracy in general and democracy in Israel. Also, you know, uh, with regard to what he said, how they feel about the Palestinians, you know, um, we always hear that it's true that um, maybe um, the senior leadership doesn't really care about the Palestinians, but, uh, you know, that's the uh, public sentiment, so that, that's why they should care. But also, again, let's, you know, um, we, we remember that they're not a democracy, so also the public sentiment has has less, uh, you know, effect. Um, so I, I'm not sure that the agreements are, are at risk, but there is a question, which I'm pretty sure is your next one, mm -hmm. about new uh, deals maybe in the future. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big one that Netanyahu really wants, which is the Saudis. Yeah. You led me right into my next question. Good for you, Noah. Um, again, before this election, before this uh, government uh, came in, all eyes were on Saudi Arabia. Everyone was wondering, what will it take for them to come in, to join the Accords, to have full diplomatic relations um, uh, with Israel? Is this something we can even contemplate right now? Uh, is it still in any kind of sites, um, given perhaps the shared interest in countering Iran? Or is it just a non-starter with this current government and Israel should consider itself lucky if the Abraham Accords hold as they exist and not aspire to bringing any other countries in, especially Saudi Arabia? Uh, I'll start with you, Hussein. 
I think they can aspire all they like, but uh, under current circumstances, it's not happening. I think there's some hope in Israel that when Mohammed bin Salman becomes king, everything will change. I think that's not true at all. They, you know, the, the ge older generation, the current king, et cetera, look at Israel one way. There's a reality that you have to accommodate because it's not going away and a, a fait accompli versus people in their early mid 30s and younger like MBS, the, the incoming almost certainly going to be king of Saudi Arabia and look at Israel as another non-Arab force in the region, that another the Jewish nationalism in Israel the same way there's Turkish nationalism and Kurdish nationalism and Persian nationalism and all these different Arab nationalisms. So they view Israel as some Something, uh, fairly normal in that sense, and that they can be useful vis-a-vis -vis Iran and problematic vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. And it's, you know, like any other, so something more normative. But Saudi Arabia is not going to join the Abraham Accords under, under current circumstances. They have an Arab leadership role they don't really want, but they it's thrust upon them because no one else can do it. And they have a global Islamic leadership role that they do want, and they fight hard to maintain. And they have a much more complicated, brittle, volatile political scene at home. And they have a lot of calculations countries like the UAE and Bahrain don't have to make. Plus, with this new government, it's not, it, it is not something anybody, I think, would want to uh, get in bed with under current circumstances. They're very unpredictable. I mean, within minutes of being in office, actually a few days of being in office, Ben Gvir went to create this hubbub at the Haram al-Sharif, uh, which he knew was going to be a problem. He just couldn't wait to do it. Uh, so I don't think this makes any sense. There's one final thing about Saudi Arabia and Israel, which is that Saudi Arabia already gets most of what it wants from a relationship with Israel now anyway. Israel is doing a lot of the heavy lifting against Iran's network of armed gangs in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, etc. It's militia network. And, uh, you know, that's something Israel does for its own interests. Saudi Arabia is a secondary beneficiary, but it, are, it is a beneficiary. Uh, there's already, uh, you know, so commerce in uh, cutting edge arms and especially signals, intel and stuff like that through Cyprus and whatnot. They get what they want there. They do intelligence sharing in Jordan. They get what they need mostly. And, and I just don't think under current circumstances, the math works at all for Saudi Arabia. I want to say one thing to an Israeli audience. I think a lot of Israelis in in the time period between 20, you know, 2000, the Camp David summit uh, with Arafat and Ehud Barak, and the Abraham Accords that in, in 2020, that's exactly 20 years, I mean, almost to the week, right? Uh, during that period, uh, I think the cost of, uh, you know, uh, opening up of the Arab uh, world to Israel kept going down. The cost that Israel would have to pay to get things like the Abraham Accord kept going down. And I think the Israelis got into a mindset that time is on their side and, and the price is always going to go down. And I can tell you the price in the past two years or three years for an opening with Saudi Arabia, like the Abraham Accords, has gone up. And this is a commodity that doesn't only move in one direction. It can become more costly and more difficult for Arab countries to open to Israel and therefore more difficult for Israel to persuade them to do so. It is not a one way street. And this is not a price that just simply goes down and you can wait indefinitely. And finally, they'll come begging for you. That was, I think, uh, an impression a lot of Israelis got. And it's completely wrong. Greg, do you agree? I do. Uh, I think, let's imagine Mohammed bin Salman becomes king tomorrow and he sits down at his desk and he's deciding whether or not he wants to join the Abraham Accords and normalize with Israel. Again, thinking in terms of self-interest, what does he want out of that deal? There's the security piece of it, which as Hussein said, Israel is getting anyway. There is a deep security relationship that's been built up over years. Netanyahu has met with MBS on more than one occasion. The fact that they have no diplomatic relations have not prevented them from doing that. So you already have that piece. There are economic benefits, but those are for the Saudis, secondary or tertiary benefits. 
there's a risk in signing this agreement, uh, which is that you are potentially jumping into bed with a very unpredictable right-wing Israeli government that is prone to uh, all sorts of actions that are going to be unpopular with a good chunk of your population at home. And then there's another thing that you want also out of this agreement, which is you want to leverage those to boost your standing in Washington. The Saudis know that the idea of normalizing with Israel is, is sort of a diplomatic trump card for them to play in D.C. And if they're going to play it, they want to get real benefits from it. They want to get, after having very difficult relations with the White House for the past two years, with Democrats for a number of years before that, if the Saudis were to normalize with Israel, they want to know this is going to buy MBS a White House visit. This is going to get them uh, the sort of diplomatic standing that the UAE now enjoys in Washington, where uh, much of what they do goes unquestioned because they signed the Abraham Accords. The Saudis, after two difficult years, are, are finally starting to slightly upgrade their standing in Washington. The, the White House realizes it overreacted uh, about oil prices last year, and it's been reaching out to the Saudis for the past couple of months. But now you have an Israeli government that is very unpopular in the White House that has come in for some from some from rare public criticism and much harsher private criticism from the White House. So if you're the Saudis looking at this, you think, well, maybe this isn't the opportune moment to sign this deal, not only because of the risk for us, but also because it's not going to get us the kinds of benefits that we want in D.C. A Netanyahu government that is on the outs with the Biden administration signing a deal with the Saudi government that has been on the outs with the Biden administration for two years, that's not going to give them the benefits they want. And so uh, I think they're going to continue the security relationship for now, but making that public, making that official, they're going to wait for a more opportune time. Noah, despite all this, do you think that Netanyahu hopes, dreams, believes that there is a possibility of being the one to bring uh, full diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia to pass? Well, I, I'm just going to add that um, there's the standing in Washington, but also question of arms deals, which was also, of course, part of the UA UAE deal, mm -hmm. uh, as we know. Um, but there's also um, the question of what the U.S. wants in this situation. And the theory I keep hearing, and I don't know, you know, I think it's a lot of wishful thinking as well, but the theory I keep hearing is that maybe the U.S. can leverage this to, you know, curb this extreme government in Israel, offer, you know, something with the Saudis, even if it's not the full, you know, Abraham uh, Accords, but something smaller. The so same the way they staved off us. annexation with the Abraham yes, Accords. Yes, but, yeah. yeah, but of course the Saudis don't care about Israeli democracy, mm -hmm. like uh, the yeah. Emirates cared about annexation, but still the U.S. does care. Mm -hmm. So maybe they can use that, you know, as leverage on Netanyahu. And also Netanyahu could use it within his own government, because if there's one thing that I think think is also pretty much agreed within his own coalition is that, you know, the Abraham Accords were a major achievement. They showed that we can have peace with the Arab world mm -hmm. and not with Palestinians. And we saw Itamar Ben Gvir, you know, the most extreme symbol of this government, uh, hugging with the UAE ambassador mm -hmm. um, uh, in Israel. So, um, you know, maybe there could be some kind of a combination of a smaller deal that would somehow serve all these interests. Uh, there are so many countries that, uh, that we haven't covered. Uh, the headlines are on Iran, on the Gulf, on the Palestinians. Um, but we haven't heard much about Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, um, et cetera. Since I've got such great Middle East experts um, uh, here, um, Greg, are there any sort of dark horse developments going on in some of these countries that we are not paying attention to that, uh, that you think in the next uh, few years might uh, disrupt what's going on in the Middle East? The big issue in so many countries in the region right now is economic, I think, where five years ago, 10 years ago, in the during and after the Arab Spring, you know, every conversation was dominated by politics, domestic politics, regional politics, conflict. Uh, the, the real concerns in so many countries now are socioeconomic. You look at Egypt, uh, it is once again in a cycle of having to devalue its currency, which is causing uh, high inflation. It was 26% last month. It'll probably be higher this month. Uh, it's putting real strain on people's budgets. Uh, about a third of the country is living in poverty under the very, very low official poverty line. Another third of the country is rapidly heading for poverty. It's a country of 104 million people where two thirds of the population uh, is, is more or less unable to afford their basic needs. 
that's a problem. Uh, Lebanon is now three years into what the World Bank calls one of the worst economic crises uh, since the Great Depression uh, and, and does not seem at all interested, the government does not seem at all interested uh, in making even basic reforms that might help to pull it out of this economic crisis. Uh, the currency has lost 98% of its value. Most of the country is, is deeply impoverished. You go a bit further afield, uh, Tunis, Tunisia, uh, something similar to what's happening in Egypt is happening there. Uh, Jordan is in very dire economic circumstances right now. It used to receive a fair amount of aid from wealthy Gulf states. That has all been all but been cut off uh, in, in recent years. And so the economic situation in Jordan is getting worse. Uh, I think that is likely to be the real problem for many countries across the region in the coming years, especially because the Gulf states that were once inclined to step in and bail out Egypt, bail out Lebanon, give them a few billion here, a few billion there, uh, to try and keep them from from absolutely toppling off a cliff the gulf states now are tired of being donors in the middle east uh, they are more interested in focusing on domestic economic reform economic development they're not giving the way they used to and so it's it's very difficult times for a lot of people around the region economically uh, hussein how does that affect the israeli-palestinian conflict if all of these uh, neighbors are so weakened and in such difficult, dire straits that they have to sort out their own problems and have no, uh, no strength or ability to, uh, to address what's going on in Israel or in the West Bank or Gaza. Well, I really, yeah, well, I, I mean, I just, I totally agree with Greg's analysis. This is right. In, in during the decade of, of and after the Arab Spring uprisings, you know, between 2011 and uh, 2020 or so, um, yeah, the, the arguments were mostly ideological. Really, it was a big fight in the Sunni Arab world over whether the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists, you know, more extreme than that, were a legitimate part of the political landscape or not. And uh, the uh, tentative answer for now is not. Uh, and and now we're the, these countries are really focused on economic problems. So it does have a big effect on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict insofar as Jordan in particular needs some support here. Jordan plays an indispensable role in the Middle East, but it's very low key. So people don't talk about it. But I think everyone who understands the kind of uneasy equilibrium of unstable forces <coughs> in the Asian part, in Southwest Asia, in, in the Mashriq, so to speak, of the Middle East, and uh, you know, uh, understands that Jordan is this quiet key hinge of you know, southern Syria, the West Bank, occupied East Jerusalem. Jordan plays an absolutely central role there. Uh, and in terms of uh, Iraq and the Gulf as well. So Jordan is going to need support, and I, I actually think they're going to get uh, more support than they have because uh, in the end, people need Jordan to be Jordan and do what Jordan does, if I may put it that way. Uh, as for Egypt, I think that's the other country that probably gets some support uh, because Egypt is, I think, too big to fail. All right? uh, if you let it go, uh, you know, the, the basic grievances that were uh, driving the Arab Spring uprisings are not resolved, right? The economic grievances are as bad as ever they were. The rule of law question is as bad as ever it was. Human rights and political freedom is as bad as ever it was. So you can have, uh, you know, this, this combination of, of rights uh, protests and bread protests, freedom and bread, you know, uh, coming together. And that's a very unstable thing. And I would just point at Iran. Right? Iran has all these uh, waves of protests, but they don't become revolutionary because they've either been bread protests or freedom protests. But you haven't seen the two come together. And what was so powerful in Tunisia and Egypt and in and Libya and other countries in the Arab Spring was you had bread protests and freedom protests coming together. And that really is an unstable uh, formulation. So I think Egypt probably will get uh, support to carry on. But in the end, the Arab Spring grievances have got to be addressed in some fundamental way and you know economic opportunity developed or you're we're going to see another round of of, of major earth-shattering protests again because nothing 
that the Arab Spring was about has been resolved. As a final question, let's do a quick round on how the Biden White House is responding to everything we've been talking about. We've had two years now of uh, President Biden. Uh, over the course of those two years, we've heard a lot of noble rhetoric about the Middle East, but generally in actions, a hands-off approach, continuing an era of U.S. retreat and avoidance of getting caught up in Middle East conflicts and literal withdrawal from Middle East conflict. The message, implicit and explicit, has been, we'll come in to put out the fires, but our main focus is elsewhere. We've got bigger problems in Russia and China, et cetera. Um, we've seen no major push coming for improving human rights or reducing corruption in any of the Middle East regimes, and certainly no talk of taking on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or aspiration for peace. Do you expect to see this U.S. retreat continue for the rest of the Biden administration and perhaps have it play any role in the 2024 presidential campaign? Is there anything that could happen in this region, particularly in, with, between the Israel and the Palestinians, that could push America to re-engage in a more forceful way? No, I'll start with you. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's it's true that we know that we're not first priority, that there is Russia and there's China, um, and that's fine. But also we see that even on the issues that they are involved with, you know, it's 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 not very it's not very strong. We just saw, you know, you mentioned the summit that was just held yesterday uh, in Jordan, where uh, the U.S. and Jordan said that they were understanding, you know, that Israel should halt uh, constructions and settlements and kosherizing uh, outposts. But um, immediately afterwards, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu himself said that, you know, it's not going to happen. And we didn't see any response from the Biden administration. So even when things, you know, even when they are involved, they're not really that involved. It's, it's, it's pretty, it, the pressure is very, very light, uh, you know, if we compare it, I don't know, to the Obama administration, although there were issues there as well. Um, but I just wanted also to mention, you know, we were just talking on how um, uh, um, we might see more and more demonstrations uh, uh, for freedom and bread, which is the most delicate uh, uh, situation. Um, I, I, I really, I was, you know, listening to this, and I fear that maybe now in Israel, for the first time, we will actually see the same combination. Mm -hmm. We will actually be a part of the Middle East, and not in a good way. Um, Greg, on the uh, on the intervention or non-intervention of the Biden administration in Middle East affairs in general and Israel-Palestine in particular, your last question uh, when you started this topic was, you know, is there anything that would uh, happen in the region that would get the U.S. to play a bigger role? And I mean, it's the Middle East, of course. There's always something crazy that can happen here that would drag America back into a larger role. But I think the administration is going to do everything it can to avoid it. It's really striking watching Washington from here uh, and watching sort of the scale of the problems in the region on the one hand, and then the scale of the policy initiatives that are coming out of the White House on the other. Uh, you know, when Biden came for his trip to uh, Israel and, and the West Bank last year, he came with a big offer to the Palestinians of upgrading their internet service to 4G in the occupied West Bank, as if he were the Palestinian communications minister and not the president of the United States. Uh, we've seen presidential advisors spend a huge amount of political capital, of time, of energy, uh, working to finalize things like the transfer of two unoccupied islands in the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. Uh, a, a gas arrangement that would allow Lebanon to receive a, a tiny bit of gas and maybe have one or two more hours of electricity each day, uh, the demarcation of a maritime border between Lebanon and Israel. These are perhaps all worthy things, but these don't seem like the kinds of things that deserve this level of high level White House attention. But they're getting it. I think part of the reason they're getting it is because the White House looks at the region and looks at the big problems in the region and thinks they are simply unfixable and, and you can't blame them for thinking that. But I think it also reflects this administration's approach, which has been, it's been very slow to staff up on the Middle East. There are still uh, important embassies in the region two years later that don't even have ambassadors. Uh, it has not put a lot of, you know, if, if personnel is policy, as the saying goes in Washington, there's not a lot of personnel working on many Middle East issues. You have a small circle of people around the president, Brett McGurk, Amos Hochstein, people like that. Uh, who focus on issues in the region. And as someone put it to me the other day, they basically exist to keep the Middle East off the president's desk. And so they're out doing their own thing and, and trying to prevent any of this 
from reaching a level where the president really needs to deal with it. There's just not a lot of interest. And so I think, uh, you know, barring something on the order of uh, a open war with Iran or something like that, uh, I think the administration is going to do everything it can to stay out of the region and just pursue these sorts of, of small ball initiatives. Hussein, you're the geographically closest of yeah. us to the White House. So what do you think? I'm, I'm extremely close to the White House. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, no, I think Greg's, Greg's basically right, especially on Israel and the Palestinians and stuff like that. But I think there's something else going on here that's very quiet, that's really important, which is that the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fallout from that transformed the way the administration and a lot of serious um, security specialists in Washington view the Gulf region. Rather than, uh, you know, sort of conceptualizing it in terms of a burden that has to be, uh, you know, um, sloughed off so that you can pivot to Asia and engage in great power competition with China, I think it's now reconceptualized as the epicenter of U.S. global power. I think they've looked at the question of energy that the Ru Russian invasion of Ukraine has uh, brought up. And uh, I think that they now see that uh, U.S. Um, security um, control and, and sort of uh, guaranteeing the stability and security of the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, and the, the, the Arabian slash Persian Gulf, plus the three choke points there, the Suez Canal, Bab el Mandeb, and the Strait of Hormoz, as one of the biggest, if not the biggest, single uh, competitive advantage the United States has over global rivals. And, and I think there's a new focus on the need to maintain a heavy U.S. presence, a, a maritime presence and strategic presence and in those areas because of those choke points and how crucial they are to the global economy as shipping lanes, as hubs for energy, et cetera. And, and so I think that's uh, framed the partnership that the U.S. has with some Gulf countries in a new light. It's no longer oil for security, if it ever was. Uh, that's out. What it is now is uh, more of a mutual shared goal, like maritime security and stability and keeping these lanes open and keeping the markets stable for different reasons. And it looks, uh, it's, I think the, the uh, U.S. relationship with countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE is starting to evolve into one that looks a lot more like the U.S. relationship with European countries or Japan and or South Korea. It's a lot more of a partnership uh, where there's burden sharing, a lot more the Saudis and UAE better have to do for themselves and spend. But at the same time, they have more leeway to do what they want, China, et cetera, as long as they don't cross red lines. And, and I think there's, a, you know, it's really interesting how since early October and the kerfuffle that Greg was talking about over oil quotas uh, created a, a contribution in Washington, the extent to which uh, under the hood, very quietly, these relationships are being seriously repaired. The workings are back uh, in motion, and I think there's a lot of stuff quietly going on um, that's very serious between the United States and Gulf Arab countries. That's a big improvement. So, uh, you know, you got to look under the hood, though. Uh, the the uh, I think it is all being done sort of uh, with, t in order to keep uh, it out, off of Biden's desk. But I think that's a shared goal. I think everybody, uh, at least all the U.S. and all of its friends want that. Uh, and so uh, it's actually going quite well in that respect. Well, I'm glad we could end on some form of optimistic note, which is definitely an achievement when you're talking about the Middle East. Um, in this short time, I think we've managed to take a pretty comprehensive tour of the region. And I would like to thank this wonderful panel for helping us do that. Um, thank you, Noah Landau, Craig Karlstrom, and Hussein Ibish. I'm Alison kaplan Summer, and um, thank you so much for uh, attending our panel.
the Nazarian Center is dedicated to promoting the study of modern Israel, both at UCLA, in the local community, and now around the world. In terms of teaching, our primary mission is to teach UCLA undergraduate students about Israel. Within the local community, we put on programs, lectures, and talks. What we do fundamentally is Israel education, not Israel advocacy. We're not there to try to convince people to believe a certain thing or to think a certain way. We're just trying to arm people with more information, more knowledge, and a deeper and more nuanced understanding. And hello to former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Hello, good Thank to speak you. with you. Um, we have a lot to discuss today and you've been very active over the years on the issues of Middle East peace and trying to bring together Israelis and the Arab world. When you look today at the new emerging Middle East, and we're uh, now two years after the Abraham Accords, uh, and yet at the same time, we're seeing heightened tensions between Israel and the Palestinians again, uh, especially ahead of uh, this year's Passover and Ramadan. Is the overall picture more optimistic or pessimistic from your point of view? It's more optimistic in the sense that I think the Abraham Accords was, was a hugely significant agreement and event. Um, and I do think that the, the path is now open for Israel to become an accepted member of, of the region. Now, I st still think that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is extremely important to resolve. Now, I've worked on it for a long period of time, but in recent years, um, myself, my institute, my office in Israel has focused on how we bring about better relationships between Israel and the Arab nations, because I think if if the if the region as a whole moves in that direction of modernization and rapprochement, then I think you've got a much better opportunity then of resolving the Palestinian issue as well. So you believe it will be an outside-in kind of impact? Yeah, I, I thought for some years that you're not going to create the right circumstances for an Israeli-Palestinian agreement unless two things happen. First of all, I think there has to be a, a fundamental reunification of Palestinian politics on the basis of peace, and that at the present is a distant project prospect. But secondly, it's not going to happen unless there are good relations between Israel and their Arab neighbors, because the anxiety of Israel is always around security. If they're living in a, a region that's essentially hostile to the state of Israel, it makes it far harder to persuade Israeli people to take a step for peace. On the other hand, if the major countries in the region are working with Israel, um, are engaging not just in, in security talks, but also um, agreements around commerce and trade and culture, then you've got a far better opportunity to create the right context in which people feel safe enough in Israel to take a big step for peace. So there's a lot that still has to change, but the big change that's happened through the Abraham Accords is that this is a signal from the region that it wants to move on from the past. And the important thing about the Abraham Accords, in my, in my view, is that it's not some of the other agreements with Egypt and Jordan in the past were peace agreements in the sense that they denoted the absence of war, the absence of conflict. The Abraham Accords is a warm peace. It's a peace that's meant to produce greater ties between the people, between um, the different sectors of the economy in Israel and the Arab nations, and therefore it's going to put down much deeper roots. So we definitely saw momentum building for the Abraham Accords, I would say up until a few months ago for sure, and there was talk maybe about Saudi Arabia joining. We remember President Biden visiting Israel and then flying directly from Tel Aviv to Saudi Arabia. Do you think that is still relevant with the current government in Israel and the strong far-right component that it includes? Look, I still think it's, it's, it's where the region wants to go. Just to take a step back, my, my view of the Middle East is that it's, it's all about a struggle for two things, religiously tolerant societies and rule-based economies, because those are the two things that give you opportunity in the modern world. Right? No country is going to progress today if it has a if it turns religion into an ideology and has a narrow-minded view of the world, that the world belongs to the open-minded today. So that's the first thing. And those countries that are modernizing in the Middle East, UAE, 
um, Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar, Bahrain, you know, actually further going into North Africa, Morocco, and so on. Those countries that engage in that process of modernization in trying to put religious tolerance in place of religious extremism, I mean, Egypt also is trying to do that, and Jordan, these countries, they represent the future for the Middle East. And if they can combine that with, as I say, rule-based economies in which people can start businesses, grow businesses, become successful, then you're, you're in a whole new world. So what, what's, what's happening today is that the region has decided Israel's not its enemy, right? Israel's not its problem. On the contrary, Israel offers a lot of opportunities. However, the region also does care about the Palestinian issue. Sometimes I think there's a feeling in parts of Israeli politics that maybe the region has just given up on the Palestinian issue. It hasn't. It still considers it important. It, it wants, a, frankly, a, a, a more capable Palestinian politics to work with, but it's, it's still very much aligned with that Palestinian cause. So you've got to look at these things as a whole. They're going to continue to want to work closely with Israel. But yes, of course, they will have anxieties, particularly any, any change in the status of, of Temple Mount, of Haram al-Sharif. That would obviously be a, a red line for them. Yeah, and we saw that even with the United Arab Emirates, which I think is the friendliest of the Abraham Accords countries in many ways to Israel. And yet when we saw Itamar Bengvi, our new national security minister, go up on Temple Mount immediately after the government was sworn in, it seemed to have an impact even in delaying Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to that country. So the Palestinian issue still, you're saying, has an impact on the relationships with these countries. Can Israel make a breakthrough with Saudi Arabia while we're seeing tensions rising in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, potentially also in Gaza? Well, it's hard to judge, frankly. The one thing I would say, though, is that the mood within the Arab world towards Israel has changed fundamentally. And I don't think that will alter unless there's a sense that, that Israel is, is in a way, as these countries move towards greater religious tolerance and opening up their, their societies, unless there was a sense that, as I say, with, with the, uh, the Temple Mount, then, that there was some desire to change the status because that would cause huge eruptions within the, um, the whole of the Muslim world. So. Uh, but, I, you know, the Prime Minister has made it clear that's not the case, and, and they will expect that to be not the case. Yeah, and so will we uh, here in, in, in Tel Aviv. Um, do you think this new alliance of Israel and its friends in the Arab world is more about what Israel has to offer or more about the joint threat coming from the East, from Iran? Yeah, I, I often get asked this question, and as 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 well as a, a an office in in Israel, my institute has um, an office in the Gulf region, and we, you know, I spend a lot of time there. I think when I come next to Israel, it'll be it'll be over two hundred times I've visited since I left office, and likewise, I spend a lot of time in the Gulf countries. I think, of course, that there is a the, the part of the background to this is, is a recognition of of reality, which is that. Israel is not the threat. Iran does pose a threat and poses a threat to the entirety of the region. And so, yes, of course, there's, there's, a, there's a, a common security threat because of Iran's attitude to Israel. And there's a, also, I think, a common respect in the region for Israel standing up to Iran. But I do think it's more than that. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with the leaders in the region. You know, they're not, they're, they're actually quite admiring of that part of Israel that's about modern technology, it's about, you know, what it can do for the world, it's about creating successful business, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about a tolerant society. I mean, these are things that, that Israel stands for, that today has an appeal to those countries. And remember, in Saudi Arabia, for example, 70% of the population is under the age of 30. That bit of the population is hugely in support of the reforms of Mohammed bin Salman, and they want, you know, the, they, they want a country that's open to the world. They themselves are, are young people get better educated. Half the graduates coming out of Saudi University this year are women. You know, they, they want a world that's open to them. And therefore, for them, they look at Iran and all the repression that's happening there. They look at Israel and they, and they think not just on security grounds, but on the type, on the grounds of the type of society they want to see. Why should they be hostile to Israel? <laughs> and so I think what, what you've got in the region with this new leadership is really an outbreak of rationality. 
That's a fascinating comment, and it relates directly to the big debate we're having here in Israel these days about the judicial overhaul the government is doing. And this also connects to the issue of Israel's place among Western democracies. Where do you think Israel needs to position itself in this big struggle we're seeing today for the future of democracy and the liberal world order? Well, look, I don't, it's, it's not my place, and I don't want to get drawn into it the debates in Israel at the moment over judicial reform. I mean, obviously, I keep keep well informed about what's happening there because I have an office in Israel and so on. And, and I know the president of Israel, who I know well and respect a lot, is doing his best to try and find a way through. But in, in general terms, no, it's really important for Israel that it stands for those values of open-mindedness, of tolerance, of willingness to work with others, of reaching across the boundaries of faith and culture. I mean, the, the, the reason why Israeli science and Israeli technology has, has contributed such an outsized impact to the world is because of, of people being creative and being open. And, and this, is, this is the future. You know, as I said before, the world belongs to the open-minded today. So, of course, people always want Israel to stand for those values and to be a fully democratic nation. Yeah, that's uh, definitely an important uh, issue to note, also in the international context. Um, looking again at the Iranian question, do you foresee uh, any kind of major change right now in the international policy toward Iran? We saw the report a few days ago about the enrichment of uranium to a level of 84%. Um, and yet at the same time, there doesn't seem to be any new diplomatic initiative on the horizon. Where do you see this issue moving forward? Yeah, so there are a number of different questions that are that are very difficult to to resolve. The first is, um, what is actually happening in Iran today? I mean, my institute again focuses a lot on Iran. We have a a, a section of the institute that works specifically on it. I think there is a general consensus that the dissent in Iran today is of a different nature from that of a decade ago. Um, that this is a dissent that's being driven actually by exactly the same types of, of sentiment that I was describing earlier. People want religious tolerance. They want to be able to be free from the repression. You know, the whole the whole atmosphere, I think, in, in terms of the opposition in Iran is very much now centered on the nature of the regime itself. And this is obviously highly threatening um, to, to, to the regime and to those like the IRGC that, that obviously have a huge amount of control over society. So that's the first thing. And it's hard for, for people to judge just how, how significant this opposition is. But I have to say that the reports that I'm getting have changed in tone over this last year. They've become much more optimistic about the prospect of genuine change in Iran over the next few years. But then you've got the nuclear question. And I think there, I think it's highly unlikely now you return to the G JCPOA or, or some form of nuclear deal, because um, I think you know, the, the, the way the Iranian regime is behaving, it has undercut any belief in its good faith. Um, and then I think at the same time, there is a general acceptance, certainly amongst the Western leaders I speak to, that Iran should not be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. So this is going to be, of all the issues on the international horizon today, some are very, you know, clear. Um, Ukraine, the fight is clear. What happens is not clear, but the fight is clear. But I think one of the, those that could come out and suddenly be a major question is, is Iran. So I think, you know, that, that acceptance that a nuclear, an Iran with nuclear weapons is unacceptable, that, that belief is very, very strong. Do you believe it could uh, open the door eventually for some kind of military intervention? I think, as, as the American administration has said, you know, all the options are on the table. Obviously, it's best that it's resolved peacefully, but I, 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 you know, the, the, the problem with the, the regime in Iran is that they continue this process of destabilization across the region. And that's one of the reasons why, as we were saying earlier, the Arab nations look at what they're trying to do and see them now as fundamentally opposed, not, not just in terms of interests, but fundamentally opposed in terms of values. And one of the things that I, I suspect is, is actually fueling some of the dissent in Iran is that... Unlike the 1979 Iranian Revolution, 
and then the storming of Mecca in Saudi Arabia that produced actually a, a surge of religious conservatism in Saudi Arabia. Now you've got a, almost an opposite dynamic. You've got a social revolution going on in Saudi Arabia that is really pushing the open-minded approach to the world. And then you've got I Iran still with a very repressive culture and still with essentially um, an Islamic regime turning religion into a political ideology, which is the one thing I think the region is, the Middle East region is wanting to turn against. So I, one important word that you repeated both in the context of Israel and the Arab world and Iran and the neighborhood is stability. Um, and uh, I think that's definitely an important issue to see from the Israeli perspective. One last question I want to ask you, as someone who has invested so many hours on this issue, do you think we should still be looking at the two-state solution as the only option, or is it time to think about the unthinkable and look at other potential scenarios as well? Yeah, people, again, people often ask this, and I say to them, um, I don't know what the alternative scenario is. I mean, you can have a debate about what does a two-state solution exactly mean, but you know, we're, we're just about to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, which brought to an end the, the conflict then, which I negotiated when I was prime minister. And, you know, in the end, it came about for two reasons. One, there was the political leadership to make it happen. But the second reason was that those people that wanted a united Ireland realized they weren't going to be able to bomb their way to it. And those people that wanted a united kingdom realized that in the end, the nationalists and the Republicans who wanted a united Ireland weren't going anywhere. And I think the reality is the state of Israel is here to stay, right? No one's, no one's going to succeed in destroying the state of Israel, in my view. The Palestinians aren't going to leave, you know, their home. They're not going to leave it. So the question in the end is, because the interests of both are obviously to work together and to live together, the question ultimately is going to be, well, if that's true, how do you create a framework in which the aspirations for self-government of the Palestinians are recognized, but Israel has security? And all the time when people say to me, well, maybe all that's fallen by the wayside, I say, well, the Palestinians aren't going to leave, and the state of Israel is going to carry on existing. So at some point, People have got to come to an agreement. Now, what exactly that agreement looks like, you can debate, but it's going to be something that looks like a two-state solution, or at least has the elements in it that look like that. Food for thought for us. Uh, Mr. Blair, former Prime Minister Tony Blair, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Dov Waxman, uh, the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and the chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. Um, I am joined with uh, Amir Tibon, the deputy editor of RRS's English edition. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this conference. We hope uh, you found it interesting, thought provoking. Um, we've really uh, enjoyed uh, doing it and learned a lot ourselves. And uh, throughout the conference, we've been receiving questions. So we wanted to now um, you know, see if we can answer some of your questions. Uh, so the first one I'm going to I'm going to put to uh, Amir. All right. Um, so you know, this conference is taking place at the backdrop of massive protests that have been taking place uh, in Israel, um, and uh, these protests have been growing week by week. I mean, something like I think 400,000 Israelis in the most recent uh, demonstration. But one of the things that's been notable is the relative lack of uh, involvement of uh, Arab citizens of Israel. And the fact that the issue or the Palestinian issue uh, hasn't really um, appeared very prominently in the demonstrations. So we have a question asking why, why that is. Why have these demonstrations not really addressed the Palestinian issue? First of all, Dov, I would say it's great to be here. 
at the Nazarian Center at UCLA, and I want to thank all of our viewers who joined us today for the conference. Second time we're doing this conference, the Haaretz UCLA Cooperation, um, and so it's becoming a tradition by now, um, and I'm very, very glad that we were able to produce such a great uh, conference with so, lot, so, so much interesting content. Now, to the issue of the protests in Israel, um, I think in the first interview of the day, when C.P. Livni spoke about what's happening right now in the battle for Israeli democracy, she said something very interesting. She said that we are seeing Israeli politics being redefined. Um, and the old dividing line in Israeli politics of right wing and left wing, mostly revolving around the issue of the occupation, the settlements, um, the occupied territories, is no longer the defining issue of our politics. It may return after we sort out our internal mess. And remember, there's also quite a lot of mess on the Palestinian side, which is also divided right now between the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza. Uh, and they've been uh, literally at a civil war for now 15, 16 years. Um, and instead of seeing Palestinian unity and then perhaps peace talks with Israel, we're seeing the opposite thing happening in Israel, a disintegration of Israeli society right now, um, because we're seeing the most extreme religious right-wing government in Israeli history, leading a very, very controversial move to change the balance of power between the authorities in Israel. And we see a coalition, not a governing coalition, but a coalition of different organizations and movements and citizens of different backgrounds in Israel rising against this government. And it's a very diverse coalition. You see a strong presence there, obviously, for the liberal, Bastions of Israel, Tel Aviv, Haifa, you see every week, and huge demonstrations in these two cities. But also, you see it spreading to peripheral parts of Israel, demonstrations with thousands of people every weekend in Be'er Sheva, in the Negev, and um, in Ashkelon, Ashdod. I mean, you just see it even every... In yeah. Efrat, even Efrat, in Efrat, in a settlement in the West Bank, you see more and more religious people attending. The high-tech sector in Israel, which traditionally has never really been involved in politics. It's more about making money. And we're happy that it's that way because that money then is a big part of our you know, state budget and Israel's economic success story. But suddenly you're seeing thousands of high-tech workers week after week joining the demonstrations. Uh, reservists in the army, the biggest headline today in Israel as we are holding our conference is that dozens of Air Force uh, uh, pilots, reserve pilots, have uh, told the government that they will not show up for reserve duty if it passes this judicial overhaul. Um, there is one key piece that is missing, and I agree with the question. We don't see a lot of Arab Israeli citizens join these protests, at least not yet. It may change. We're seeing signs that it is beginning to change because I think there is an understanding in the Arab society in Israel that this judicial overhaul could also be disastrous for the rights of the Arab minority in Israel. Uh, the Supreme Court in Israel uh, does not have a perfect track record uh, when it comes to protections of human rights. And uh, there have been complaints over the years that it was too um, lenient toward the, the military and defense system. But at the end of the day, without the protections of the Supreme Court, uh, the government would be able to take more extreme steps also against the Arab population. So we're seeing that change. But it's important to understand this is not a protest movement or even a political divide that is focused on the Palestinian issue, the settlements, the occupation. Not that these issues don't matter anymore. I believe personally they are crucial, fundamental for the survival of Israel and for the question of what kind of country you want to be. But we are also dealing now with a major internal rift that is more about questions of the balance between democracy, Jewish identity, and the balance of power between the Israeli authorities. Absolutely. I think in, in, in many ways, it's, it's difficult for Arab citizens of Israel to, to join these protests in large numbers, partly because it seems like the discourse of the protesters is, is focused, is really kind of emphasizing Israeli patriotism. It's very Zionist. It's very Zionist. It's Israeli flags everywhere. Flags. Yeah. They emphasize now, particularly the military service, um, things that um, really exclude to a large extent most Arab citizens of Israel. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this protest is so successful, right. I think. And you see in public opinion polls that a majority of Israelis now are against 
this government. They are against the judicial overhaul. They want the, they're against the parties that compose the majority of the government. They're against specific legislation when you ask them about specific components of this legislation. And I think a big part of it is when you see all these former generals and you see people coming to the protest um, and saying, you know, I was a soldier served here and there and now I'm fighting for my country. This message, message resonates, but I think it's very important to also find a way to involve the Arab Israeli society in this movement because First of all, you cannot build an effective opposition in Israel without Israeli Arabs. And second of all, again, what is at stake for us, Jewish citizens of Israel like myself, is also, and even more perhaps for the Arab citizens, for Absolutely. the minority. Although I suppose the, the, the difficulty faced by the movement is that uh, if they um, bring in the issue of the occupation, and if they um, make clear that this is connected to, uh, to the judicial uh, overhaul, um, that could actually fragment the protest movement. I mean, and that the very broad nature of it is in a way premised upon the, ex the exclusion of the elephant in the room. The blanket becomes too short to cover both the Arab uh, Israeli uh, exactly. uh, society and the what we call more moderate right wing, which supports the settlements, but does not support Netanyahu bringing the occupation inside Israel. Right. Um, but I will say, though, there was an interesting moment last week because of this terrible and shameful uh, riot that we saw by uh, hundreds of settlers in the Palestinian village of Hawara, suddenly I think there was a moment where it clicked and you could see that people realized that these two things are connected to one another. Even if you don't accept the entire uh, anti-occupation uh, um, argument that Israel needs to withdraw and there needs to be a two-state solution, uh, I think you can still realize that what happened in Hawara last week, where basically after a terror attack where two Israeli uh, young men were uh, killed, people decided to initiate collective punishment on an entire village and burn down houses and stores and threaten old people and children. And this is something that cannot be acceptable. And it's related to this attempt to weaken the judicial system um, because lawlessness, if you want to have a country without laws, and where only power, where only force reigns, this is what it would look like. And I think that was a moment where people did see somewhat of a connection emerging between these two struggles. Absolutely. And also the uh, kind of selective application of laws. Absolutely. Because, uh, interestingly, the government, uh, you know, passed in the first reading of this new law to impose the death, death penalty uh, on, on terrorists. On terrorists but yeah. It's basically those who aren't Jewish. Yeah. Um, and there's no discussion that any of the Jewish terrorists involved in the rampage in Hawara will face that, let alone, we will even have let's, a let, Let's even see them arrested, first of all. And also there is a sense that in this government, with the far right Itamar Ben-Gvir being the Minister of National Security, um, the police is taking a tougher line against peaceful protests in Tel Aviv uh, and in Haifa than it is against these uh, uh, people in Hawara who, and now I'm not quoting from the editorial of Haaretz, I'm quoting the uh, General uh, Fuchs, who is the commander of Israel's Central Command, he called this a pogrom. Right. So, which is uh, uh, some strong language from an but, idea. Uh, well, but, well, absolutely. I mean, it's right in this case. Absolutely. So, we have a question that's come in about um, the potential connection between the protests that are happening in Israel and the possibility of military action against Iran, and whether um, these protests are in some ways perhaps um, preventing. The Netanyahu government from carrying out a military uh, attack against Iran. Um, do you see any connection there? I think that, for, first of all, the question of attacking Iran involves other components, and it's not just an internal Israeli question. There is a question of the American Absolutely. approach, and will this be acceptable to the Biden administration? There is a question also of regional partners that Israel has gotten very close to in recent years with the Abraham Accords, and with the secret ties with Saudi Arabia, how will these countries respond to an all-out war with Iran? There is a military capability question. Can Israel even carry out such an attack? And there, yeah, and there are different opinions about this question and different interpretations of the military abilities. But it's true that having a situation where the country itself is being split into, and there's all this tension and violence in the streets, um, and we're seeing hundreds, it's been hundreds so far, of uh, soldiers in the reserve corps and officers saying they will not serve. 
Although I think these people, if there is, God forbid, a full scale war, they will show up for duty. I have no doubt. But the question is, will they be there to prepare and do training? And also a war that starts from an Israeli attack on a different country is not the same as a war of necessity that starts because we were attacked. Well, the great, the great fear would be that at least some elements of the Israeli public and possibly uh, the Israeli armed forces might see this attack if, if it was a to attempt. as an attempt yeah. to distract attention. hundred percent. And, and the mere potential for that perception is, uh, is unprecedented, really. I think, generally speaking, Israelis believe that when their government yes. sends them into, into combat, they do so based upon security considerations alone. Dov, here I want to quote a smart man, Benjamin Netanyahu. When Ehud Olmert was the Prime Minister of Israel, and he was facing his own uh, criminal uh, investigation that later turned into charges in court and then into uh, a guilty uh, a verdict and he went to jail. But before all of that, when Olmer was just being investigated, Netanyahu, then the leader of the opposition, stood up before the Knesset, said a prime minister who is, you know, uh, so deep in the dirty waters of corruption and police investigations cannot lead this country because the public cannot trust that prime minister, that his decisions are not being made because of personal interests. And I think he was absolutely right. And this is the moment we've reached. There is such distrust um, and there is a sense of um, suspicion on any decision that Netanyahu would take, especially a huge decision like war. And that's why we heard the American ambassador, Thomas Knight say several times, that if Netanyahu wants to do big things, I think what he meant was, you know, end the Iranian nuclear threat, whether I think America would prefer not by military strike, but still, you know, relieve Israel of the Iranian threat and potentially make peace with Saudi Arabia, you cannot do it when your own backyard is on fire. Absolutely. And I think one of the, the challenges for the government is just the, the number of crises it's dealing with right yes. now. I mean, there's the domestic protests, which I think have taken everybody by surprise Big in terms story. of the scale yeah. And, yeah. and the fact that they're continuing, you know, not just week after week now, but day after day. Yeah. Uh, clearly that shocked the government. But along with that, you have a deteriorating situation in the West Bank. Um, and, you know, um, warnings that this could really spiral out of control, particularly with the approach of Ramadan and Passover. Yes. And on top of that, you have Iran uh, now reaching 84%, you know, cl inching closer and closer to weapons grade. In most Iran. days, it's not even the biggest story in the news, although Iran is really on the verge. But but you know, though, when we talk about an issue of legitimacy, you heard, just like me, uh, Daniel Gordis, earlier in the panel we had on uh, uh, the nationalist uh, far right and the rise of populism, I think, fascinating panel. Yes. If you didn't watch it, yeah. you can uh, look it up later on the arts. If you ever want to see an, a left-wing Israeli intellectual agree with a right-wing Israeli intellectual, that's your opportunity. But, but, and, and to hear, yeah, to hear Daniel Gordis, who I think for viewers in America is famous as someone who is an advocate for Israel and uh, writes, you know, in defense of Israeli policies and explains the uh, complications and difficulties that Israel is facing. For him to come and say that the court Israeli government looks like a gang of thugs. Yeah. It's unprecedented language, yeah. and it shows you the legitimacy a, a problem that this government is facing that goes beyond the natural environment of the Israeli left wing. It's a much bigger issue, right? Absolutely. But I think one of the things that the conference really um, made clear was that this isn't just a domestic issue. Yes. This is an issue yes. that is affecting Israel's foreign relations um, you know, in, in, in lots of ways, at a, at a particularly delicate time. I mean, it's always a delicate time, but right now with this confluence of crises, it's particularly uh, interesting to think about how these protests might be impacting, whether it's Israel's response to Iran's nuclear program, whether it's Israel's response to escalating violence in the West Bank, yeah. um, and uh, US-Israel relations. So I want to ask you a question about that. We did receive a question that asks, why is the Biden administration still speaking about the two-state solution? You have this government in Israel. It's basically controlled by Likud and then everything to the right of Likud. The far right elements like, you know, Bezalel Smotrich, the finance minister, Itamar ben have never been more powerful. The government just announced major construction in the settlements and legalizing outposts, the illegal settlements, according to Israeli law, that they're about to whitewash and make it legal. All of this in the face of Joe Biden. How can the Americans still 
speak about a two-state solution when they see this reality is one of the questions we got from a viewer. Well, it's a, it's a very good question. I think it's one that many people have been asking in the United States as well. Um, I think part of it, you know, President Biden himself um, is deeply committed to a two-state solution. I think uh, he is somebody who um, has long been a supporter of that. Um, and, you know, I think it would be hard for him personally. Old, to kind old of, habits. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we see that in, in his approach to other things as well, that, that, you know, many Democrats have wanted him to take um, a different approach on some domestic issues as well. But his um, political worldview was formed in many ways in, in, decades ago. Yeah. And it's difficult, you know, he's an 80 year old, it's difficult for him to, to change his mind at this point. So I think part of it may be personal. Part of it, I think, is uh, the fact that the administration is just, uh, as we heard during the conference, um, preoccupied with other issues. So the it really doesn't have the bandwidth right now to rethink its approach to the to the conflict, even if it wanted to. They're saying to this we have an answer. Let's stick to it. Let's stick to it. They, at least they can. At least they have a policy. Um, and there's just so many other issues, particularly Ukraine. I think uh, Susan Glaser's uh, comments were really well taken. You know, of just how how much Ukraine is distracting the administration from addressing the Israeli-Palestinian issue or from what's happening in Israel. Um, and I think the other, the other um, and let's not forget, you know, we're about to enter a new election cycle yeah. in the United States. So the last thing that the administration would want or Democrats want is, you know, a fight um, over its, its policy toward uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I, I think, you know, in some ways, you, you said this yourself, actually, in a in a podcast, um, in a Haaretz podcast on Wally, that it's a bit similar to the administration's policy on uh, the nuclear agreement with Iran, mm. right? That, you know, even when everybody knew that a nuclear agreement with Iran was basically no longer going to happen, the last people to, and they still haven't said this, yeah. is the Biden administration, because there isn't, an inter there isn't a plan B. So until there's a plan B in place, the Biden administration will continue to mouth support for a two-state solution. What's striking to me isn't so much that they continue rhetorically to do this, but that they're doing very little, if not nothing, to actually even help yeah. bring this about. I mean, it seems to be purely reactive. Um, the, the recent uh, Aqaba summit, um, you know, which was which the administration touted as like, here we are, You're getting involved. Bad, yeah. In many ways, the fact that this happened on the same day, you know, this pogrom in Hawara, really, it may, to my mind at least, emphasized how disconnected yes. the administration is from what's happening on the ground and, and, and maybe how little ability it has to actually influence things. Yeah, it was ridiculous when we saw Secretary Blinken uh, put out this tweet celebrating the Aqaba summit hours after this terror attack when where two Israelis were killed and then the pogrom in the village and it's like everything is on fire. Aqaba, it, it was an important attempt, and I commend them for trying. I think what they tried to do there to bring together the Israelis, the Jordanians. And that was the first time, I think, the in Palestinian. the years that Israeli it's, it's, yeah. it's a good idea. I mean, this is how it should work. But there is also reality. And this, maybe the political actors right now are not right. And by the way, Dovan, what you said on Iran, we did get an interesting headline in, the, uh, in our conference from the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Herzog, who basically said, Israel and the U.S. are much closer today in their views of the Iranian issue than in previous years. I think he was trying to say Obama without using right. the words Obama. When he said closer than in previous years, he meant, you know, that I think it's not the Obama versus Netanyahu situation anymore. Um, he said we're much closer and that a new nuclear deal is off the table. So what the administration is not saying, maybe the Israeli ambassador in Washington is willing to say. Right. Um, but on the two-state solution, I think it's perhaps a little more complicated because the Iranian issue, there is policy of sanctions at least that is in place and you can toughen the sanctions even more and you can react to some Iranian uh, bombshell ideas like you know enrichment to 90% with even more and more economic pressure. But on the Israeli-Palestinian issue without negotiations to a two-state solution, which right now sounds like a joke, they have no other they policy. No There's nothing. There's no fallback option. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the you know one of the things, the other thing that was striking from from a number of the panelists there during the conference was, um, you know, when it comes to well, Israelis are, are divided domestically, and we're seeing these divisions, um, certainly over the Palestinian issue. On the Iranian issue, actually, this 
really a broad yeah. consensus. Really, there isn't much debate on what should be Israel's policy toward Iran. Yes, but I want to add a but, which is if, and we talked about if there was an attempt to go to war for nuclear strike, I don't know what would be the reaction. In the past, when Netanyahu uh, was thinking about striking Iran, he ran into very strong opposition from his own security establishment, from the Mossad and IDF and Shin Bet leadership, who said, we don't think it's a good idea and it's better to try other uh, methods. I don't know how it will be this time, if, uh, if, if, it, if it's on the table. Um, there's another interesting question here um, that has to do with the Israeli-American relationship, which is, you know, do a lot of Israelis miss having Donald Trump in power? Um, you know, relevant. After I'm sure weekend. Netanyahu does. <laughs> oh, Netanyahu. And I want to say, we were not the only conference happening this weekend. There was also CPAC, yes. where President Trump spoke. I don't think he mentioned Israel, though. I don't think so. In fact, I think he spent more time, um, than, uh, you know, attacking George Soros, which is his now his um, favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Talk about you know bringing the far right methods from yeah, uh, Hungary. The, and, absolutely, yeah. and I think uh, you know as Susan Glaser said during the conference that you know the, the, this kind of Trump 2.0 is an even more radical figure. Um, and you know I think she drew a very interesting analogy with Netanyahu that you know often people are are basing their perceptions of these of the leaders based upon. The, how they were in office in the past. In Trump's case, it's pretty disastrous, in my opinion, when he was last in office. But that it, the same with Netanyahu, that Washington, for example, are thinking, well, we know Netanyahu. He's been there know, so he's long. Been, you know, yeah. He's a, a generally a cautious leader. He's not going to launch any sort of military adventures. Um, but, but, you know, these people change. And, yeah. and in particular, as they become more desperate, um, then base of support can narrow and they can find themselves in bed uh, with some, you know, unsavory characters. I mean, in Trump's case, it's the open embrace of white nationalists. And in Netanyahu's case, it's the open embrace of far white extremists. It's Sahanists. Sahanists. Basically, you know, Trump, Trump dined with uh, people who are openly neo-Nazi and anti-Semitic. And in Israel, we're seeing the most extreme racist, you know, the, the Sahanist movement was always completely banned and on the fringes suddenly in the cabinet. Uh, but so I think in terms of, you know, missing Trump, um, how do you, how would you say Israelis perceive Biden? I mean, you know, clearly Trump was a lot more popular than Obama was. He was very unpopular among, at least among Israeli Jews. Um, has Biden kind of restored the perception in Israel that, you know, Democrats can also be pro-Israel? Yes, I think Biden is nowhere near the uh, Obama uh, levels of, uh, you know, support or criticism in Israel. I think he's much more popular. Again, maybe because he's less challenging to the Israeli yeah. government. His visit to Israel in the summer was a very successful one. It was still when Yair Lapid was prime minister. And from Israel, he flew directly to Saudi Arabia. Um, and so that was nice as well, the idea that, you know, we're seeing this new Middle East emerging. Uh, I, and I think among the Israeli center left and the protest movement right now, there is this expectation that Biden should do more, that Biden yeah. actually has the power to stop Netanyahu and his government. Um, and we heard uh, the American ambassador uh, Knight say that um, uh, Netanyahu should pull the brakes on the judicial overhaul. And I think there is an expectation for Biden to get more involved and to send us a clear message. And again, out of a place of caring for Israel. But I, I think it's a, an argument that I've made. It's that, yes, he cares about Israel, but there's something else here. Biden has staked his presidency on the uh, battle to preserve democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did here in the midterms against the advice of some of his closest aides and advisors who said he should talk about gas prices and not about democracy. I think he was right. You yeah, saw the, yeah. how the midterms played out. In Ukraine, this is obviously his biggest argument, that this is a fight for democracy against tyranny. So to see on his watch a close ally like Israel join the ranks of illiberal democracies like Turkey and Hungary, I think would be a failure for the, this idea. And I think this is why there's this expectation for him to, to get involved. Do you think it would make a difference if he did? I mean, you know, when when uh, Ambassador Knights made a fairly mild comment just about slowing it down, you know, uh, he was uh, the reaction by some ministers in the government was pretty strong. Yeah. Um, you know, would it could it backfire? Would uh, you know would Israelis or at least the Nisan, the, the, the Nisan government 
how might they respond? They, maybe they would use that in a way to actually uh, pull back some of that right wing support that they seem to be losing today. That's an interesting question, how it would play out. But I think most Israelis understand the importance of the relationship with the United States and that it's a unique relationship, different than all the other alliances because of the level of support militarily and because of the Jewish community over here, which there's nothing like it anywhere else in the world. There's not a single Jewish community with a million people anywhere outside the US. And here you have five to six million people. Um, and so I think there is an understanding also that Biden himself mm. is a very supportive president. And in, if you look at the Democratic Party today, he represents the pro-Israeli right. faction of the party. And so anything that he says will have he an effect. He has the credit in a yes. way to, to do that. Now, of course, it will not be the sole de deciding factor. The most important thing here at the end of the day is what Israelis will do and say. And whether it's this protest movement, whether it's the reservists who are now putting a lot of uh, um, really pressure on the military, and we're seeing the chief of staff of the military warning the government that this could lead to a break. Um, the economic situation, there's a lot of factors here, but the United States definitely is an important factor for any Israeli prime minister, and obviously for Netanyahu, who understands it's better than most of his coalition partners. So, so I want to um, bring up the another couple of foreign policy issues that came up in the conference. Um, the issue of Ukraine, we haven't talked about yet, and uh, Israel's policy there, and the the, the possibility um, of bringing in Saudi Arabia into the Abraham Accords. Uh, starting first of all with Ukraine, um, it seems to me that you know if the Netanyahu government wanted to. Um, you know, increase its uh, popularity in Washington today and maybe prevent Biden from intervening in the domestic issue, the easiest thing that they could do is actually provide some defensive weapon, shouldn't call it weaponry, yeah. defensive military assistance yes. to uh, Ukraine. Um, do you, I mean, you know, in, in our first panel uh, in the conference, it was pointed out that really there's been kind of a consistent US, uh, Israeli policy now under three different prime ministers. Do you see that changing at all, even with Russia's weakened position in Syria today? I think you made a very smart point that if Netanyahu wants to get some uh, goodwill from the Biden administration and Western European allies, so what can he do? On the Iran issue, there's very little he can give them. He's not going to commit not to, to do a military strike, and I think rightly so. The Israel should at least keep the option in its set of you know, tools. If it has the option. Yeah, or, or the idea of the option. Yes. On the Palestinian issue, he can give absolutely nothing because it would bring down his job. Right. Uh, in, you know, on the issues of Israeli democracy and civil rights and issues that are important to American Jews, for example, which mm -hmm. are an important component of this puzzle because American Jews are largely supporters of the Democratic Party, he can give absolutely nothing because right. his government relies on the ultra orthodox On Ukraine, he can give something. Without paying any political price, none of the parties in his coalition would uh, bring down the government if Israel sent an uh, Iron Dome to Ukraine. Right. The question is, is he willing to stand up to Vladimir Putin? So far, we've seen the opposite. Netanyahu and I think Ksenia Svetlova, the former mm -hmm. member of Israel, made an excellent point in our panel on Ukraine. But she read through Netanyahu's new biography, autobiography mm -hmm. and saw that every time he mentions Putin, it's a positive he has raising admiration. Uh, absolutely, she used the um, word much admiration. like Trump. Another similarity yeah. with uh, former President yeah. Trump. So, would he be willing to change that to take Biden's side against Putin's? That's a really interesting question. Now, maybe the fact that Russia and Ukraine, uh, sorry, that Russia and Iran are getting so close, is will push Israel in that direction even without a decision. Uh, and Efraim Levy, the former Mossad chief in our panel on Ukraine, made an excellent point that the. Russian-Iranian alliance is creating new facts on the ground, also in the diplomatic arena. Um, so definitely an interesting question to ask. Uh, Dov, I want to ask you one last question that is, I think, you know, really summarizing everything that we spoke about and also reflected in the, in the questions we got from the audience, which is at, at a time like this, when we're seeing this internal crisis in Israel and the spillover into foreign policy and the U.S.-Israel regime, what is the role of uh, American Jews, the diaspora, people who support Israel and care about Israel abroad in this kind of very, very delicate, sensitive situation that's evolving now? 
Well, um, I would say, you know, the, the role is, is changing um, rapidly in response to what's happening in Israel. I think, you know, historically, diaspora Jews and, and, and American Jews saw their role as, you know, supporting from the sidelines, um, sending uh, money to Israel and, you know, lobbying on Israel's behalf in, in, in Washington and elsewhere. Um, I think that kind of spectator role um, is no longer um, acceptable. And in fact, you know, is, is now being rejected even by organizations that have long and individuals like Daniel Gordas, for example, yeah, but... who have long said, you know, the role of American Jews should be to kind of support and not criticize. There's been an outpouring of criticism um, from American Jews and including from very establishment mainstream Jewish organizations and individuals is really unprecedented. And I think it, it, ref, it uh, reflects a recognition that the stakes in Israel today are so high. Um, as Zippy Lipney said in, in, in your interview with her, you know, this is really about the future of Israel. It's not just about the fate of the Supreme Court. This is about what kind of country Israel will be and whether it will be a democracy at all, or at least a liberal democracy. And I think um, that uh, awareness, the recognition of that is, is now um, spreading across the American Jewish community, as well as other parts of the Jewish diaspora. And for many American Jews, I would say the vast majority, you know, Israel's uh, uh, democratic identity um, is, is in some ways no less important than its Jewish identity. You know, if Israel sees the two are directly the two connected, directly connected uh, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Um, so this, the, the, set, the fear that Israel will cease to be a, a democracy in a meaningful sense, or at least a liberal democracy, I think is a really scary prospect for American Jews. I think it would bring about, as was said during the conference, you know, a, a rupture in, in this relationship. And so you're seeing a mobilization of American Jews in opposition, not just, you know, uh, the, the usual suspects, not just from the left, but from the, from the center and even from among the Orthodox. And so just as the protest in Israel is really unprecedented in its breadth, the protests now occurring uh, in, the, in, in the American Jewish community, I think are also unprecedented. Um, and whether these protests will be enough to change the course of events, we'll have to see. Maybe in next year's hour. Maybe uh, we'll, we'll deal with that next time. So thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, we hope you found this conference to be uh, really interesting and engaging. Um, if you have, uh, please share it with your friends and family. The conference will still be available. The full recording of the conference will be available on uh, Haaretz's website, as well as on the website of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and on the YouTube channel. So please share it, uh, watch it again, and join us again uh, for our next conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dov. Thank you, everyone.